so. Let's go. Good evening. It's 7 p.m. and I'd like to open the February 11th, 2021 school committee meeting. This meeting is being held virtually through Zoom. The town of Littleton began conducting remote participation Zoom meetings pursuant to Governor Baker's emergency order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law on March 19th, 2020. Since that time, unanticipated legal concerns relating to the open meeting law have been brought to our attention by the town clerk. Those concerns were supported by the Attorney General's Office and confirmed by Town Council. One concern is that the chat function allows a parallel text conversation to a board's public meeting. Chat is essentially running commentary that is occurring but is not moderated or followed by the chair. All participants and listeners may not be aware of comments being made because some meeting participants join by phone and do not see these conversations. Another concern is conversations between residents within the chat room which are not incorporated into the public record. In response to these concerns, the town will implement the following changes, which in no way prohibit any member of the public from participating in discussion and sharing information during a public meeting and will ensure that all listeners and participants have equal access to this meeting. People that join the Zoom meeting are set so their microphones are muted. If you called in by phone, please use star six to mute or unmute your phone. So that the meeting can occur in an orderly fashion, we ask the people who join keep their microphones on mute so background noises do not interfere with the meeting. If you wish to participate in the meeting, please use the raise your hand function available on Zoom. Or if you called in by phone, dial star nine, which will activate the raise your hand function. The meeting host will notify the chair of the raised hands and the chair will determine whether and when to allow public comment. When called upon, participants should unmute then state their name and address. After speaking, we request the participant return their microphone back to mute. All right, with that out of the way, we'll start the meeting. I'm going to start with the consent agenda, the minutes from January 28th, 2020, and oath to bills and payroll. Make a motion to approve the minutes from January 28th, 2021, and oath to bills and payroll. Sorry, 2021. Thank you. Second. All right. It actually, Dorothy, it does say January 28th, 2020 in the... Uh, on the agenda so we can update that for next oh. week's next meeting's minutes. All right. Uh, thank you. A motion made a second. Is there any discussion on that motion? Hearing none, I'll call for a roll call vote. Matt. Uh, <clears throat> Matt Hunt. Yes. Justin. Justin McCarthy. Yes. Timlin. Timlin Rossius. Yes. Brad Austin. Brad Austin. Yes. And Mike Fontanella votes. Yes as well. All right. We will have uh, at least two sections in the meeting for input from interested citizens, one now and one closer to the end of the meeting. Uh, we may very well entertain uh, input uh, at other agenda items, but at this point, if there are any, uh, anybody that would like to speak before the school committee, please use the raise your hand function. And Dorothy, our meeting moderator, will get you in front of us. We do have one hand raised. Okay. Okay. Wendy Isaac, please state your name, your street, and your question, please. No. I don't know why she's, let's see. Um, I believe she needs to be promoted because of right. the down level version. Okay. I will do that. Wendy, state your name, your street, and your question, please. She's not coming up. Would you like some help? She's not, yeah, she's not coming up. Not sure why. Thank you. Here she comes. You're getting closer. <laughs> Suspense Wendy, is killing me. Muted. There you go. Wendy? Can you hear me? Wendy, you're not connecting. Wendy, you're not work you're not connecting. Do you want to hang up and try again? There we go. All I right. don't know why. All right. It if she comes back and she does raise her hand, we'll we'll interrupt whatever we're doing to uh, to get her in front of us. Okay. Okay, she's not there, so we could probably move on now. Okay. All right, Dr. Clenchia, under recognition, do we have anything we want to go over? 
A few things, thank you. Uh, we had a great parent presentation on uh, parenting in unpredictable times on uh, Tuesday, February 9th. Uh, our guest speaker, Dr. Uh, Braithwaite. Uh, the presentation focused on uh, toxic stress, trauma-informed care, and supporting ourselves and our children through difficult times. I'd like to thank our wellness committee and our PTA for teaming together to make this event possible. And also special thanks to Mrs. Steele for facilitating the presentation. On February 2nd, our district held a virtual family STEM night, which was a huge success. Special thanks to Mrs. McGregor for organizing this event. At our last school committee meeting, as we all know, we decided to opt into pooled testing. Uh, what that meant for us is we had a week to uh, invent a process and, and uh, develop a plan, get approval from multiple sources, uh, meet with a vendor, organize supplies, school lists, et cetera, and uh, uh, also uh, send consent forms to staff and students, tabulate them, uh, create a, a process for each school that was uh, suitable for, for the age span that we were dealing with. Uh, we made it happen. We uh, finished our, our second pooled, uh, a round of pool testing today. Certainly uh, was a busy time last week, but I'd really like to thank uh, Mrs. Snow, our nurses, our admin team, and Mrs. Philpott, our, our COVID-19 uh, coordinator, uh, for uh, working tirelessly to get this done. It was a huge undertaking, but I have to tell you, uh, things uh, went really smoothly this week. So, Kudos to everybody involved, and uh, I, I'm really glad that we, we opted into this program. The data point uh, will be very useful as we maneuver our way through the rest of this school year. Thank you. All right. Great. Thank you. All right. We're going to move into presentations. I'm going to start with our athletic director, Mike Lynn. Good evening. Uh, thanks for having me back again. I do have a uh, slide presentation that I believe is being pulled up right now. Okay, so um, we're up to the the fall two season, which, uh, you know, I think we talked about way back when we were having the fall one season that certain sports would be pushed to fall two, and here we are. So if we could go to the next slide. Uh, just to give you an update on winter. Uh, this slide just shows you, obviously, our participation numbers uh, across all the sports that we had. Um, one point of discussion, I think, that when we had, when we were heading into winter was some of our co-op sports, but they've, they've gone pretty well. Um, I will say that the winter season has pr proven to be much more of a challenge than the fall season was uh, in, re in, in regards to COVID. Uh, particularly coming out of Thanksgiving and in the holidays, um, but we're we're doing pretty well now. But uh, it it definitely was more challenging as far as managing contacts and close contacts and things of that nature. Um, just as everybody has seen, the numbers are definitely uh, increased. So, anyways, here's our numbers. Um, we had pretty good numbers as far as uh, across all of our sports. We were able to have varsity and JV and boys basketball. We did not quite feel the JV girls team in a normal year. We would, we would file for an eighth grade waiver, but we're, we're really not doing that um, this year, given the circumstances. So we just stayed varsity only. We were able to field varsity and JV and hockey. As you all know, the girls ice hockey program, unfortunately their season was canceled. Um, that was a Westford school committee decision. Um, and then uh, we had indoor track practice only. Uh, they'll be part of the fall too, which is coming up in the next slides. And then obviously we had our co-op uh, students participating on those respective teams. Uh, next slide, please. Just to give you an idea where the teams are, everything's wrapping up uh, over the February vacation. Um, Varsity Boys Basketball, I actually sent this slide to central office yesterday and the basketball teams all wrapped up last night. They're right re they're, they're regular pod season. So, uh, you know, the, this one game has been played, so they just have the pod playoffs left. The boys do. They'll be playing on Wednesday over the vacation. It'll be live streamed on LCTV. Uh, while I'm mentioning that, thank you so much to Mike Fontanella and Mark Crory and everybody at LCTV. They really saved us this year with a live streaming 
as there were no fans allowed in the uh, gym or the hockey rink. So really did a, a tremendous job with live streaming uh, across multiple platforms, actually. So people had many viewing options. But we'll be on LCTV on Wednesday night for the boys. They'll get a bye on Monday. The girls will be playing on Monday as it stands right now in the quarterfinals of the pod playoffs. And the hockey team has two matchup games over the um, February break. Uh, the JV teams are both will be wrapping up or they already have wrapped up. And this just gives you all the records across all sports up to this point, including those co-op sports. Uh, if there's no questions, next slide. Okay, so looking at fall two, state and MIA guidance, uh, some of these bullets, they've been on every presentation I've done thus far this year, and, and it's still relevant. So all sports at the youth, interscholastic, and adult levels must follow the current EEA guidelines. Uh, those were updated on Monday, and there was some significant changes to those guidelines, um, which we'll get to on this slide. Uh, the MIA fall two season dates as set by the MIA are 222 to 425. Uh, th those are the dates as set by the MIA. As you'll see on an upcoming slide, our league and district have adjusted some of the sports. Um, MIA sport committees have provided guidelines for all approved fall two sports. So those are posted on the MIA website. Uh, they're pretty easy to find. When you go on that main page of the MIA website, there's a there's a banner across it that says COVID uh, task force. I believe you click on that and, and those, those guidelines are there for the public to view. Um, they will be, they will be subject to change. I don't know if that's happened yet based on those EEA uh, changes that happened on Monday. And I don't know if the guy, the sport committees have had a chance to update those guidelines yet. Still have leagues organizing into geographic pods. Um, there are no MIA playoffs for the fall two season again, so it's just pod, pod life again. No, no uh, state playoff system. Uh, per the new EEA guidelines, as of Monday, for outdoor venues, spectators are limited to two adults and two siblings per participating player, provided social distancing of six feet can be accomplished. Now, that's what the EEA guideline allows. That's not to say that that's what our league is going to do or our district is going to do. But that was a significant change because prior to Monday, the number was 50. Um, and they've changed this dramatically. And I, I understand, as I understand, I think these EEA guidelines, even it's even for like the Boston Garden and, and every other type of venue. Uh, the indoor venues now, I didn't put it on here because it won't impact us in fall too, but indoor venues are limited to 40% of the total capacity. And outdoor venues are what you see there for sports uh, under the age of 21. Uh, transportation per guidelines, which uh, Dr. Clenchy just sent um, new guidelines that came out today that are dramatically different than what we were following, but I don't know that it'll impact how we're doing things, but it does change uh, what we had been following previously. Uh, next slide, please. Hey, Mike, can I ask a question about that last slide, though? Um, the distancing there, is that six feet between the adults and siblings or between that family group and other family groups? Between family groups. That makes sense. Thank you. Yep. Um, so football specific modifications, um, you know, football obviously falls into the higher risk category, but the nice thing is it's an outdoor sport. Um, I will say, you know, basketball was challenging. Uh, we, I have the girls team in the gym right now practicing and, you know, overall, it's gone well, but it, there were some challenges, particularly when the numbers, the, the COVID numbers were peaking. Um, it's definitely going to be nice to be back outside again. Uh, indoors is definitely more challenging. Hence, we did not allow any fans into uh, hockey or, or basketball games. Um, but so here we go. Face coverings are required. Uh, that's almost almost a given at this point that they're required except for mask breaks. Uh, the team boxes in football are extended all the way to the 10 yard lines and six foot social distancing must be maintained on the sideline. Typically those team boxes end on the 25 yard line, but they're going to be all the way to the 10 yard line so that players can be spaced out all along the sideline with six foot distancing. The maximum roster size for a football team is 45 players. That really doesn't impact us right now. We anticipate a roster size of 35 to 40 players. 
Uh, we're going to separate into a varsity and a JV cohort um, to start. There might there'll be additional cohorts, you know, with line line and skill and things of that nature. But pretty much dividing the team in half, varsity and JV. Um, we don't. We're probably not going to be able to field a true JV team. Um, we are talking about doing provided football is approved. We're talking about doing like a fifth quarter scenario where immediately following the varsity game, we would, we would take the players that did not see much playing time or no playing time at all and do like a fifth quarter format where the coaches run it uh, similar to scrimmage format. We'd go 10 plays on offense, 10 plays on defense, just to get those kids some, some, um, you know, some play against another school. But I don't think that we're going to be able to field a JV team in the in the the normal sense of playing on Monday and, and that whole thing. I think I think it'd be a challenge even if normal circumstances, but during COVID, I don't think it's going to be possible if we're going to try and stick to cohorting between those two two uh, two cohorts of the team. Uh, players and officials, again, this has been true for all sports. They arrive ready to play, officiate. We're not putting them in locker rooms. We usually go in the middle school locker room. They're going to have to arrive ready to go. Um, players provide their own water. Again, football traditionally during a water break, you would see everybody squirting water bottles, but it's going to be a little different. And there's more time allotted for, for um, in between quarters and timeouts and everything for people, for the kids to be able to get water. Um, the time between quarters has been extended. I just mentioned halftime has been shortened, but time between quarters has been extended. Mandatory water breaks at the halfway point of each quarter have been added. Again, just try and do uh, hydrate, and it's going to take a little bit longer to hydrate because each player is going to have to get their own water bottle, and uh, we won't be passing around the squirt bottles like it's probably been done for 50 years. Um, no handshake ceremony, and the MIA football rules modification and guidelines document is readily available on the MIA website. And that is found uh, just by clicking the COVID task force uh, banner on the front, on the main page. Um, there's no questions. Next slide. So one of the things we learned during the hockey season is the typical ear loop mask does not work for the helmet sports. Uh, we went all of one varsity game and one JV hockey game and we had players about one third of our players had this style of mask on. This is called a game on mask. And it took me all that one game of each to say that we need to get every player in one of these masks. And so our hockey program went to fully to these masks by our second games. Um, Cause I could just see the, the masks weren't quite working underneath the helmet. So first time we had problems with helmet with masks, honestly, um, every other non helmeted sport was fine. So, as of right now, there's two options for football. You can go with this style, which is like permanently, essentially permanently affixed or affixed to the helmet. And the other style that is people are looking at is a um, balaclava type, uh, like a, a helmet. I mean, a, um, a head, a hood for your head, you know, that has a, a integrated mask. That's the other option I think would work. But uh, just in case people were wondering how is a face covering going to work in a sport like football, we already did it with hockey with a helmet. It worked pretty well with this, this particular mask. That's what it looks like. Uh, next slide, please. Um, cheerleading, there, it, it, as of right now, we, do, we would plan to move on with cheerleading. Um, again, face coverings required. Maximum roster size is 20, but we anticipate a roster size of 17 maximally, if that's if every – Every uh, cheerleader decides to participate and none opt out. We had 17 signed up. Uh, arrive in uniforms, no locker rooms, provide their own water. Stunt groups must work in cohorts of 10 or less. Stunts are limited, no inversions, twistings, or pyramid. In, in dialogue with our coach, w this isn't going to be a concern because we're actually not going to do any stunts. Uh, we would be a dance team, a cheer team, and a tumbling team if cheer was to be approved we will be uh, not doing group type stunts or pyramid type stunts. So uh, each girl would be pretty much socially distanced and would be cheering, dancing, and there would be tumbling runs. The tumbling would be individual runs. Uh, that's through my conversation with uh, Coach Sundquist so far. Uh, voice projection is, is permitted only outside. Uh, they can't do, they can only do rehearse cheers indoors in a talking voice. 
And again, there are guide, there are modifications. The modifications and guidelines document is available on the MIA site. Next slide, please. And indoor track, which was pushed to fall two. Um, this is a little bit interesting, but I think we can make it work. Face coverings, obviously required, except for mask breaks. Detailed guidelines are provided to ensure social distancing during all phases of practices and meets. Um, you know, they have things like using every other lane in different different ways when a race is over as to where the where the athlete should should finish in order to um, to get their breath again. But it's going to be done fully masked. And um, there are provisions in place, like like I said, like skipping lanes, uh, using every other lane. So they're not running right next to each other in lanes and, and staggered starts and, you know, smaller heats, things of that nature. Uh, arriving. No locker rooms, full uniform, by the own water. Here's the key thing. In our league, indoor track will be out will be an outdoor track um, season. We will we typically run our indoor track practices in our gym, in the hallways, in the parking lots, in the weight room. Um, we would only have any practices in the gym in very small groups, like you know, uh, a small cohort of hurdlers or something like that. Uh, but predominantly it will be fully outdoors. The meets will be fully outdoors. Indoor track, a typical season would be four or five, four, four or five schools at one of the, the large schools that have indoor track field houses. That would be Shrewsbury, Wachusett and Fitchburg. None of those schools will be hosting any meets this year. So what we would do in place of that is use indoor distances on our own outdoor track versus one other school. So, um, you know, it, it would be an outdoor track meet, but it would be with indoor distances in, in, in the indoor events uh, for those for those student athletes that are missing out on that true indoor track experience, which just isn't really feasible right now, given um, the numbers that indoor track typically attracts and the fact that those schools are not going to bring in um, guest schools into their facilities. And then the other facility that we go to routinely would be the Reggie Lewis Center in Boston, which again, um, not really on the table this year. That's where the big meets are all held. And uh, you're just you're an indoor track meet. You're just talking about high volume of kids in an indoor space. Not really going to work. Um, again, modifications and guidelines document is available on the MIA site. Next slide, please. So actions that the Midwatch League and MIA District uh, 2 and 3, where District 3 have taken follow again all EEA, DESC, MIA, Board of Health and local district guidelines for athletic participation. We've altered some of the start dates for various reasons. Football would still start on 222. Um, obviously by the amount of snow on the ground, that would probably take, take the shape of uh, gym practices, non-padded, non-contact, in cohort groups, smaller groups, broken down, to work on different skills and in install phases of football. Um, it would probably transition then to parking lots while we wait for the field to be clear of snow or down to an inch or two or a couple inches of snow where it could be used. Cheerleading start date is March 1st, and it is a game day only, no competition. Uh, the MIA would allow for like virtual competitions, as I, uh, I believe in the guidelines, but we've decided to be game day only and no virtual competitions, just it would be game day cheer. Uh, indoor track as start date right now is 315. It could be changed to 31 tomorrow at league meeting. Um, I'm not sure right now it is 315, just basically saying that holding off until the conditions are a little better in the parking lots and on the track right now because of the amount of snow. Um, not that distance runners can't run on pretty much anything, but some of the other events would be very limited until the, the conditions are better. Right now, our parking lots are full of salt and sand and everything else. So, But it might change back to 3-1, and, and, and then we would figure out a uh, plan from there. We organized into geographic pods, but we also uh, took competitive balance into factors with football. Um, football is a different – it's different. It's always treat, been treated differently, and you can't just organize into geographic pods and have um, 
have mismatches because it's a very bad situation when you have mismatches in the sport of football. It's not quite like a basketball game. That's a 30 point differential. Football can be a really uh, negative experience if there's a lopsided game. So we try to avoid that the best we can. So uh, the pods are competitive balance is taken into effect into a uh, factor shortened season, certainly a uh, very short season, really Littleton's current football cheer pod tentatively includes Clinton, Hudson, Maynard, Tingsboro, and West Boylston. Again, like West Boylston is a little further than we would probably opt to travel, but we had with, with competitive balance, it just kind of worked out that way with football. Indoor track pod is right now, Air Shirley, Bromfield, Groton, Dunstable, super close towns, um, all border towns for us. And, uh, those are the towns that we would probably hold dual meets with. And the plan for spectators still being discussed at this time. Um, I think that'll be finalized tomorrow, at least at the league level. But then there might be dialogue at the local level between, say, myself, um, the principal and the superintendent of schools as to if, you know, what we're going to allow at our own facility. Um, we know what the EEA is allowing and the MIA just refers back to the EEA. And then the league is going to come up with a scenario and then uh, that will be subject to discussion at our own local level. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, again, th these bullets have been talked about each time, but I just feel like it's, I have to um, revisit them. Uh, it's important to know that, especially right now, athletics and co-curriculars are voluntary privilege and, you know, parents, students, and coaches have the option to participate or opt out. We've certainly seen that this season, this year. Uh, we've had athletes opt out, um, and, and that's fine. And I think that it's for, I think it's an individual decision. I'm, I'm happy that we've given people the opportunity to make that decision in, in the Littleton Public Schools, and I do think that that's the way to proceed, that we give people that option to uh, participate or not. I can tell you the, you know, the girls' ice hockey kids, when the season was canceled, they did not play hockey. They just played hockey for a club team. Um, so, and uh, club teams do not have the same level of oversight of having a, a paid coach, an athletic director uh, who answers to a principal, who answers to a, a superintendent. You know, you club teams don't have all those levels. So I definitely think kids are better off playing in a school situation with the level of oversight that we're utilizing as opposed to club situations. Uh, participation athletics Again, this was something that was profound this year that that whole giving them a social gathering uh, for students under the supervision of a qualified adult with strict guidelines and rule modifications. There's a level of risk, but, um, you know, I've never seen kids be so happy to practice as this year. Um, they're happy to practice. They love to play games. All the seasons have been short, as you saw, like a typical basketball season would be 19 games, then playoffs we're playing nine games and then a, a very short little pod playoff. And it's, um, you know, I think it's been about the right amount of games given the, the um, all the challenges uh, to, to operate sports right now. I think we've kind of hit it um, about right where it should be. And um, again, in line with that, physical health is our top priority, but we also obviously must be mindful of mental and emotional health and athletics is very important to many of our student athletes, students and student athletes. And uh, during normal year, we hover in the 69% range. And we're certainly not going to hit that this year. We're just not going to get to 69% because, uh, you know, we just haven't seen um, to the, the, the same level of participation. Our participation has been healthy, but it's definitely been down a little bit. And um, next slide. And the final slide, um, I guess... What's our participation status for football, cheer, and indoor track? And also, I would say that cheer, um, cheer should, in my opinion, uh, to they're only going to cheer at, if if everything goes perfectly. They would cheer at three home football games. That's if everything goes perfectly, and we play a six-game football season. Um, if it's a five-game season, they might only cheer at two home football games. So the only Cost for cheer this year because they're not they're not allowed to travel to away games. The only cost for cheer this year is the cost of a coach. They have no transportation and they have no registration fees for um, for competition. So the only cost to the school district is to pay the coach. 
everything else is uh, zero cost. I guess um, any questions? All right, thank you, Mike. Appreciate all the effort, everybody, you and the coaches and the, the athletes themselves have put in uh, first two successful. At this it's like um, by all accounts, things are working really well, and uh, that's no small accomplishment. I remember years of uh, high school sports and you know, you've got great bonds with those on your team and it's, it's important to remain diligent in the masking and the distancing. And while I support um, another season, I just, I want to reiterate that I think it's certainly a risk because if we do have um, sort of community spread among the teams that could have a negative impact on what the thoughts are with potentially um, planning some sort of hybrid plus model within the school system. So everyone's in, you know, it's a, it's a group, it's a team effort here across the district. And um, a lot of times uh, the athletes in the school system are the leaders in the community and everyone needs to remain um, focused on staying safe. So thank you very much for your efforts thus far. Thank you. All right, Matt. Yeah. Thanks, uh, Mike. Also, um, I would just say anything that we can do, anything that we can offer these kids, um, they really appreciate it. I can speak for my own two who are in the middle school and have been, only been able to do skills and drills with basketball, but they look forward to it every week, anytime they can get there, socialize with friends. I think it's, it's a positive. So definitely have my support and I'm glad that it's worked out as well as it has thus far for the first two seasons. All right. Brad, Timlin, no, Timlin's ready, Brad, you missed out. Go ahead, Timlin. <laughs> no, sorry. No, thanks, Mike, for making this year um, a little bit normal for these kids. Um, yeah. I know that the social aspect of sports is great, and getting them moving and off of screens is even better, and I'd be all for, especially seeing we've done a good job with the inside stuff, getting them outside and doing this, I think I'd be... I think it would be great to move forward with it for these kids. All right, Brad. Yeah, I'm going to support, the, support this as well. I really like the, the idea of having the six feet social distancing uh, emphasized on the, the sidelines and everything else. It's saying, I like Matt, I believe said, I'm more comfortable with the outside stuff than the inside. So if we're making it through the inside relatively um, unscathed, then I'm more optimistic about the outside. And, ju and I agree with Mike, if you're saying Mike, um, about the cheer reduced cost. Um, they're not getting the full experience the way other people are. Um, if we can reduce the fees for that um, proportionally, that makes a lot of sense to me. Um, yeah, I want to comment upon, because uh, <clears throat> Brad, you've asked this question, uh, how we respond to COVID um, at prior meetings. And I can tell you that prior to this winter, you know, it was a pretty simple process. We weren't really dealing we went through the whole fall season with zero incidents. And I say zero, I don't even, I don't even recall a, a close contact that we had to even monitor in the fall. That, that's how, that's how seamless the fall was. Um, we were in a pod and I bet collectively that pod almost played a, um, you know, a thousand kids probably playing and how many contests. And, and there was only one team shut down. It was a, uh, one of the Kingsboro teams, but, uh, then we got into winter. It definitely was more challenging. And I just, you know, we absolutely have a, a formula for how we handle everything. And the minute we have any kind of a COVID situation, uh, which the winter I already mentioned, it's just more challenging because it's indoors and everybody knows that the numbers absolutely, um, they jumped after Thanksgiving, they jumped after the holidays. And it seems like we're tapering back down again, thankfully. But immediately, Dr. Harrington, myself, and Chris Perrell, the school nurse, we have a huddle as soon as we have anything, a contact, a close contact, a potential positive, whatever it is. Um, we huddle right away. We make a decision. Um, in, the, in the winter, we, we probably on two occasions, honestly, we exercise what I would say an overabundance of caution early in the basketball season. And we paused our boys team and our girls team at, for a couple of days each while we were, while we were monitoring situations. 
And we honestly, by the guidelines, didn't have to do that. We just did it. Um, and as the season went along and we got more comfortable with the process of, of monitoring this, but, um, you know, we definitely have a formula in place now that we had to actually deal with real life COVID situations and close contacts. The three of us huddle together. We make a collective decision. And Dr. Harrington then immediately keeps Dr. Clenchy well informed um, of any situation that develops. Uh, so it, it definitely has evolved. <laughs> as you all know, it has evolved as the school year has gone along. Um, we've learned a lot. We, we're, we're much more prepared to handle situations, um, but I can't guarantee that, as we all know, we're, we're fighting an invisible enemy and we're doing everything we can do. Um, and, you know, this winter was challenging, but it's overall, it was, a, it was another success. Well, I appreciate you saying that, Mike. And it's, it's one thing that's been, and I appreciate y'all taking those proactive steps as one thing we've seen. I mean, we're a school system. We're also kind of school ecosystem and there we have there as, as I think Justin was talking about, you know, sports um, athletes can be, can be leaders, but they can also be vectors. And so there's, you know, there's a chance that this could, could go bad and, and, you know, ruin opportunities for a lot of people if, if we weren't as proactive and as taking this as serious as we seem to be. So I, I support your past efforts. I'm going to support moving forward, but we do have to remain vigilant and um, I'm confident you will. Thank you. All right. Um, thank you. Um, I do see a hand raised. Dorothy, why don't we see if we can get that taken care of before we entertain any motions? Okay. Matthew Ridge, please state your name, your street, and your question, please. Matthew Ridge, uh, Great Road. All right. Um, with track, I mean, I used to do track when I was younger, and one of the things was we used masks back then for what we consider tolerance training. In other words, doing it so we can actually breathe harder and everything else. Have you, I mean, wearing a mask during track during a regular sprint, I don't know. To me, that almost sounds like asking for trouble. I mean, we had kids that would, during a regular sprint when they were practicing would just, I wouldn't say collapse, but they, they would have a extremely hard time breathing by the time at the end of a, a general sprint. So are we taking this into consideration? Are we even looking at how this is going to affect our kids? Because I can tell you right now, when I'm wearing a mask in general and I'm huffing it around, uh, doing any physical labor, I'm already having a hard time breathing. I can't imagine these kids being any less of a situation. Um, well, <clears throat> it's amazing how resilient uh, students have been to in adapting to mask wearing. Um, there were people expressing those concerns prior as we were heading into the basketball season. I'm on the state basketball committee and there were some people saying, oh, you can't play basketball with masks. And, and we did. Um, kids are going up and down the court. And we thought we were going to have to have mask break stations, you know, outside. That's easy. Indoors, I had a plan for mask break um, stations in our, well, just outside of our gym. And none of the kids ever did it. Uh, they just, they didn't need to do it. And they've adapted. We ran cross country in the fall. Uh, the, the kids had masks on too. Uh, it changed a little bit during the season. There were times when they didn't have to, and then we went to fully wearing masks. Um, but yeah, I think we've had enough uh, situations where we're playing sports that require a good amount of cardiovascular endurance and, and student athletes have, have done well with the masks and um, they've adapted and it's just a fact of life right now. I hope you, I hope that stays true because uh, I, I've seen I've seen too much in my life where people have done stuff like this as adults and young adults, and they've actually ended up in the hospital. So for me, this is a worry. I don't want our young kids to be put in a situation where we have to worry about that. That's just my concern. Okay. Thank you, Matthew. I, I, I know you're talking about those masks that, that, that some athletes wear to train. Those are a different technology than, than the masks that our student athletes are wearing and that, that athletes are wearing uh, at, at other levels. 
Um, and I, it's a valid concern, but I think Coach Lynn is right. I think we've had enough uh, experience now to, to understand that it is doable. It's definitely impactful uh, doing the uh, basketball games with LCTV. There was a lot more huffing and puffing sooner than you would normally expect it. Um, but the kids adapted, you know, they were, they might, you know, pick their spots to sprint. Um, and I'm talking about a basketball player who has to go up and down three or four times, five times, six times without stopping, which is at least the equivalent of a track sprint. Um, and there, there's venting on the side of the mask and they manage. Um, but it is something that we will continue to keep an eye on and, 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 um, and, and make sure that we're not putting our athletes at risk. All right. At this point, if there's no further discussion among the school committee, I would ask if we want to entertain a motion. Make a motion to approve the fall two season for Littleton High School. Um, I'll second with the with the adage of a reduced rate for the cheerleaders, which we need to talk about, I think, before we finish. Well, I think we can we can just charge the administration with making the determination they think is okay. best. Um, okay, but I, and but I'll right, make a second. Yeah, that that adaptation yeah. that they that they will take that under consideration, I think, is sufficient. Okay, so I'll second it. All right, all right. A motion has been made and seconded with a minor alteration. Any further discussion? Hearing none, I'll call for a roll call vote. Timlin. Timlin Rossius, yes. Brad? Brad Austin, yes. Matt? Matt Hunt, yes. Justin? Justin McCarthy, yes. And Mike Fontella votes yes as well. All right, thanks, Coach Lynn. Uh, we'll see you prowling the sideline of Alumni Field soon enough. All right, thank you. Thank you. Luck. I have a good night. All right, next on the agenda, we're going to talk about the public health metrics. We have Katrina Wilcox-Hagberg ready to go. Hello, everyone. All right, here we go. You guys probably already know the punchline. Things are looking good for the state level right now, which is awesome. So these are the four um, main metrics that we've talked about forever now. Um, statewide cases and test positivity have both returned to about the same level that we saw at Thanksgiving. Um, the seven day average of confirmed cases is around 2,300 per day and test positivity is around 3% now. And this puts the state back, um, the state as a whole back in, in the yellow actually for the first week time since Thanksgiving. So this is a great sign on a statewide level. So the number of hospitalizations and deaths have also started to decline since their pink peak at the beginning of January but they remain at a level that is double where they were before Thanksgiving. So um, those are lagging indicators. They take longer to go up and they take longer to come back down. So hopefully if cases keep declining, then these will also keep declining. Um, the governor did lift the, a lot of the capacity limits and things on businesses. So people will probably be mixing more um, because businesses can have up to 40% capacity and other things. So this, We'll have to see what's gonna happen over the next few weeks, especially with a statewide school break coming up. So then we get into some local data. Um, today, Littleton had 44 cases for the two week period of January 21st to February 6th. Um, two weeks ago, we had 37 cases. So while this isn't a huge jump, we are slightly higher than we were two weeks ago. Um, and this is the 12th week in the red for us. So this is the trend lines for the average daily incidence rates per 100,000 for all the areas we've been tracking since August. Um, the Littleton's rate was 32.2 per 100,000. That again, since we had more cases, we also have a higher rate than two weeks ago. Um, not, not a huge jump, but again, we're trending flat if, if not a little bit higher. So while Littleton returned to the pre-Christmas levels, the rates are similar to pre-Christmas. Everywhere else around us has returned to pre-Thanksgiving levels. So we didn't make it down to the same level as everyone else um, across the state and um, in our region. So this is hopefully just, we had a little pause, a little blip and we'll end up going back down with everyone else. However, with school vacation, I don't believe that's gonna happen. 
So here's um, the total test positivity graph. The, again, um, the number of tests that were conducted in Littleton were stable compared to two weeks ago. We had a very similar number of tests. And our test positivity this week was 2.72%, which is just slightly higher than it was two weeks ago. Um, so again, a flattening slightly up, slight uptick. So like the rate, the trends here, um, like the rate and our case numbers were all kind of like flat and a little bit higher than we were two weeks ago. So whereas everything, test positivity and all the other areas that we track um, continue to trend downward. So hopefully we can get back in line with everyone else. So I think we're at school committee. So school data is an important thing to touch on, of course. These are the number of cases um, reported by DESE. So the number of cases among students was 462 and there were 212 among staff this week. I think this is actually, as we've been talking over and over, we talk about the school, the experience in schools with cases reflect the experience, like mirror the rates in communities. So when community rates rise, then we expect to see cases in schools. And we saw that as cases rose over the, the um, holidays, we saw more cases arising in the school. And now that the, the trends are going back down, we're, we're starting to see some declines, which is great. So there were again, school experience mirrors community experience. So it's important, one important way to, to protect our schools is to keep our, um, the spread of COVID low in the community. So, once you have cases in your school community, then the risk of finding um, transmission in the school increases. Um, this is the data from the weekly DPH report on the number of the clusters, K-12 clusters. Um, this week, there were 23 new clusters reported. That was for the period of January 10th to um, February 5th. So in those 23 clusters, clusters, the average number of cases per cluster was 4.2 and the average number of close contacts was 8.1. That close contact number, that average has gone up over the last three weeks. So I'm not entirely sure why that dynamic has changed. If schools are putting more kids into the building, so the distance between them is less then that would generate more close contacts. So this is this is one of those things you got to keep your eyes on. And the um, if policies for schools change over time, then this will change too. So these are the health notification letters that um, Littleton sends to families. Um, we had the last one I saw was from Monday. So over the last couple of weeks, we had basically four cases a week reported from that symptomatic close contact kind of testing that we've been using this whole time. Um, and so in total to date, we've had 36 cases, a few close contacts, one classroom has gone remote, but overall, Littleton's done pretty well with only 36 cases to date. And then they are spread out in the schools. It doesn't seem like there's one school that's doing worse than others. It seems like they kind of just arise in the schools and come back down. So like every time um, we wanna keep talking, looking at our cheese and making sure we're using all the tools we have available to us to help prevent spread. So um, I just wanna quickly get into I know this conversation tonight is going to center around potential changes, things that we might want to consider doing in the future as things change. And um, I do think this is a great time, like all those layers of cheese matter. So it's a great time to review what the guidances are right now. So this um, is a couple snapshots from the CDC um, website on the guidance for school operations during COVID. This guidance was originally drafted in August after we had um, come up with our own plan here and then was updated in, on December 31st. And it will, it's anticipated to be updated again tomorrow. So everyone I'm sure will be looking at the news and getting messages that that will, that has dropped. I do think um, as you're doing any conversation, it's a really good idea to have everyone looking at the same words and the same information and knowing what changed over time because that helps us guide us on what's important and what may be less important over time as we get more data. So, um, and I've also noted some confusion based on various headlines and news stories and social media discussions that I think, so I think it's important just to just, this is what our current guidelines are from the CDC. So again, remember these were first published in August and updated in on December 31st. So the CDC currently presents school opening guidelines as a continuum of risk, and they lay it out from lowest risk being fully remote 
and highest risk being no mitigation strategies. And then there's levels in between that you, depending on the mitigation strategies that could be put in play from schools and the individual situation for schools and towns, then um, that would put you at a different level of risk over time. So um, Littleton schools, what's consistent with all of these is that they're really trying to push masking, um, physical distancing comes up a lot, hand hygiene. Um, and when you have Littleton's current hybrid model puts us somewhere in the medium or some to medium risk. And then depending um, on how the students mix or how big the classrooms are, one school or the other would fall into one of those buckets. But our generally the mitigation strategies put us in some or medium across the board. So the one thing I do wanna point out is the current CDC guidelines and risk assessments don't discuss testing, how to use um, something like pooled testing. Um, although I did note that they've added an interim guidance, they've posted one recently. So I think they're gonna have more information out there, but, but it will be interesting to see what they publish tomorrow. So the other thing is the new CDC director has been presenting um, at COVID updates every Monday, Wednesday, Friday. And um, she often states that schools can be safely reopened and she emphasizes when mitigation strategies are in use. So these are three of the studies that are often referenced when the topics of school reopenings are discussed. And I thought it'd be really good just to run through the methods that were used by these um, three studies, just because it's important to know what was measured because that will help you understand the, um, the results and how it actually applies or may not apply to our own situation. So, um, so these schools that were um, evaluated and, me um, and measured represent a variety of settings. There's urban, there's rural, um, they're small, they're large, they're diverse, um, not as diverse. So all, th all three of these studies use masking and six feet of distance and cohorts um, similar to what like our classroom cohorts are. Um, or changes in scheduling to keep groups of kids together or in smaller groups. The third study actually added pooled testing. So for the first, the two studies, the first two, um, which is the Woods County, Wisconsin and the ABC Science Collective, those two studies um, reported the number of community acquired cases as being low, ranging from 1% to 3.5% among cases, cases among students and staff. And for those two studies, um, the in-school transmission was measured only among people who are identified as close contacts. Now, the close contact definition requires less than six feet. So there are a few close contacts identified in these situations because they all use six feet of social distancing. But among those people who were close contacts, um, the amount of number, the proportion of cases that arose from those situations was 3.7 to 4.1 of all cases, percent of all cases. So it was low again. So one critique of these studies is that um, the case identification was based on those self reports from symptomatic or um, close contact tr testing, similar to what our, our state currently uses for the majority of people. So we know that, we also know that kids are more likely to be asymptomatic. So there remained concern um, that there were, there's an undercounting of cases in these two studies. So although the results were promising, there was a little worrisome that we couldn't tell how much we might be missing. Is it still okay? So um, just lost my space. So the third study used pooled test. Of cheese, if you will. So they described the experience in two schools and the majority of cases in these studies were captured actually with the pooled testing. Um, these two schools were in Tennessee. They've actually had a, quite the um, outbreak in Tennessee right around the holidays. Um, so the number of community acquired cases in these two schools was 2.1 to 4.6%, which is similar to the estimate in the first two studies. So with the mitigation strategies, it kept the number proportion of cases in the school um, community low, but overall the um, proportion of cases that came from in-school transmission was higher in, these, um, in this study because they were using pool testing and capturing those asymptomatic cases. It was 9% here. So the authors also reported that the majority of the younger cases were asymptomatic. So those in elementary schools were much more likely to be asymptomatic than the high schoolers and the middle schoolers and definitely than the adult staff. 
So overall, though, when you look at all these together um, and trying to balance out the good things and the bad things from these studies, the, the strengths and limitations of them, um, the three studies all concluded that in-school transmission events are low when, when comprehensive mitigation strategies are in place, and they all emphasize that piece. So remember, they used masks, they used six feet of distance, they used closed cohorts or arranging schedules. One of them used testing. So the good news is that um, the mitigation strategies that we use here in Littleton are very similar to these that were studied in these three studies. Um, and our experience is actually very similar. We have the 36 cases work out to be somewhere around 2% of our hybrid population with the last denominator that we had reported by the school. Um, what these studies don't tell us is what transmission levels were when different mitigation strategies are used than the six feet. So if you reduce that six feet of distance, you'll have more close contacts, which might be more, um, mean you have more in-school transmission events that you have to follow up on. So things just to keep in mind. But overall, these were promising that um, with layers of mitigation, we can keep the um, number of cases in our schools down, even when community, there's community spread. So just wanted to quickly, these are the mitigation strategies you guys have put in place, um, all the layers of cheese. And so the green boxes are all, all of the layers of cheese that are in use and the gray boxes are those that we do not yet have at our disposal or we have opted not to use. Um, so as you can see, we've got a pretty robust toolkit right now. So keep in mind as we have these discussions, if we remove one of these layers, it might impact a number of them and we in different directions even. So we've got to like, sometimes hard to predict. Um, so if you remove, like again, the easy one would be like, we want to go full in, let's get everyone in. That means maybe unless you guys have space that I don't know about, we can't get them in at less until, unless we're less than six feet. And if you do that, that will increase the number of people in the building. And that will increase the number of close contacts that the nurses are following up with and potentially need to be quarantined and tested. Um, it also, you guys have the ventilation um, audit that you had a while ago. You might have some indications of how much extra, um, how might that might impact air exchanges, things like that. That would be something that you might want to look into. And then um, the unmasked times, such as lunch, are one of those those times that you might want to really try to use the six foot distance more than any other time. So that those mass breaks in the lunch um, times, you'd have to look at your spacing there. Um, and how to open windows or get air exchanges into those places. So there's a lot of things I think we can do to try to move towards full entry back into, you know, all full in person. I think there's a lot of things we can, um, we have at our disposal to try to work with. And one of the things, one of the main benefits I see is that if we use pool testing, we can measure what's happening. If you change this, what happens? So it's kind of a nice tool to have in our toolbox as we move forward. So the CDC has actually been updating guidelines nearly daily and my head is on a swivel and I can't keep up with them. But one of the main things that dropped this week is that um, the, the number of studies that they've published about improving your mask quality and fit that really increase the efficacy of your mask in preventing you from getting COVID um, is startling actually. So they were, this study was a laboratory study that, um, showed that double masking or improving the fit of your mask um, could decrease exposure by 95%. So um, to me, this is an easy thing that if anyone's in an indoor setting, whether it's the grocery store or school, if you're in a setting where you may not be able to keep distance or um, you're gonna be there for a while and you're indoors, it's just an easy thing to put your a surgical mask or a filter in your under your cloth mask and just just add another layer in there. It's it's cheap, it's easy, and it's accessible to everyone. And it actually not only protects you as the person wearing it, but it will protect everyone in the room because they'll just be left less virus in the room. So that's something I would encourage people to consider um, upping their game with. And then the last thing I want to do before I sign off is leave you with one last public health plea. Um, you've heard me say this before, the data is consistent locally, across the state, nationally. When there's a holiday, the number of cases jump um, they bump up for a week or two after the holiday. And that's, that's, that's what we see here. The red arrows here mark every week, the week following a holiday since the state reopened in June. So that's, you know, 4th of July. When the, when the, um, 
prevalence of COVID is low in the community. You don't bump as high, but when you get up to these, when we have more COVID in the community, there's a bigger jump. So um, we are approaching President's Day. We are approaching the school break. And during that time, our families' behaviors will change. And the new variant is in Massachusetts. opening and just see what we have to do and how we want to st stay the course. So thank you. All right. Anybody else? Justin? Uh, um, yeah. Thanks again, Katrina. That was excellent. Um, it's interesting that the study, the three sort of studies referenced are similar to what we've been doing. Um, is there any data um, about any changes that those districts have made. I, I think just like a quick reference, I was able to see that potentially one of those districts has gone full-time and I'm wondering um, sort of what they did to accomplish that. And I'm also wondering, oh, I mean, are there studies, I'm sure there are districts in other states potentially that have been, I don't know, masked and HEPA filters and CFM air movement and all that stuff, but maybe they're at five and a half feet. Uh, do we have anything like that that we can talk about? So I have to admit, I didn't follow up on the experience of these stu these schools that I just presented on currently. These all, all these studies ended in December, I believe, um, or November. So interesting. I know that the Durham, North Carolina schools, which was part of the ABC Science Collective, are actually anticipated to be remote for the rest of the year. Um, so it would be interesting to see if the Wisconsin one or the Tennessee ones are able to get more people in or at least continue the course. I haven't followed up on that. Um, the, in okay. terms of studies that I have been trying to look for studies that are measuring masked, but less than six feet of distance. Um, because I think that's an important piece of data that we, I would love to see some studies like this um, measured and to be able to compare, but I haven't found any yet. Um, and I'll keep looking. That's, I just, there's only so many time hours in my day <laughs> to do this. Sure. Part. But yeah, no, I think that would be really interesting to see something similar to ours, except for one layer gone, one layer of cheese gone, which I'm, because we would want more kids in the building more often, it would be that distancing layer. So I will keep my eye out and then we'll share anything I find that um, fits that. But uh, right now it seems like the majority of schools went all in or nothing. And um, so it's really hard to compare experiences from schools that did nothing because we've done stuff. Um, so what is, which layer do we want to loosen up to see what we can and still achieve um, safety? Okay. All Thanks. Right. Anybody else? No? Dorothy, I see a hand raise. I want to see if we can bring her forward. Jen Gold, please state your name, your street, and your question. Hi, Jen Gold, 259 Harwood Ave. Um, hey, Katrina, thanks for the data, as always. Uh, my question is, now that we started pool testing in the schools, do you know if that data is going to be added into the overall Littleton um, testing and case positivity data. I mean, I would imagine that if it is, and it certainly should be, uh, the numbers would look better because we're gonna be testing more and more people who are asymptomatic, 
not having had close contacts or um, scares in any way, theoretically, the numbers of cases, positive cases will go down. So I'm wondering if that data will be added in. Um, would love to know that. Thanks. So it is my understanding, and maybe Lynn Snow and the school team can actually explain how this gets in. Um, but it is my understanding that it positive cases get reported to the state. Um, so I would expect that we will and so they can go through the close contact, um, contact tracing, things like that, that we expect our procedures to do. What I don't know, and I need to keep my eye on, is um, how they would count the denominator for the pooled tests. So um, that is information I have yet to figure out how they're going to report that into the town data. But all positive cases will definitely be captured. I am assuming that an individual will be who has in the pool will be counted as positive or negative, depending on their final outcome after the Binax town now reflex testing. But again, um, I need this. We don't even have data that tracks that yet. I think next week will be the first one where our testing data would be captured. And I can see the number of tests, whether that goes up or not to see if um, it captured the number of people and hopefully the school knows how many people tested so I can track that number pretty closely. Right. I would think both the numerator and the denominator need to be captured. Otherwise, if they're just capturing the number of positive cases, but not the number of people tested, that would just contribute to more, a higher case positivity ratio, right? So both. It would contribute to a higher number of cases, but it wouldn't, it would definitely skew our case positivity that the test positivity. Right. Yeah. I totally agree with you. And I'm sure there's a way that the states thought that through. I just don't know what it is yet. I'm assuming colleges, but colleges did individual tests. So I, we will see, and I will keep okay. my eye out, but I haven't seen any guidance on how that impacts our numbers yet. I, my plan, I've been tracking the number of tests week over week for since the beginning. So we'll see if this jumps suddenly, we'll know that it's the school test. Right. Okay, Lynn, Lynn Snow actually think, I think has a comment on this, Lynn. Yeah, so um, the pool testing is is screening, not diagnostic, so that number won't be captured. But if we get a positive pool and then we do reflex testing, that's the reason why um, parents who consented needed to create a profile in Project Beacon because that's through the state and DPH. And so then we'll, we'll be able to capture the number of reflex tests that we're doing as a result of a positive pool. And then that's the secondary follow-up testing. Yes, that's correct. Okay. So, yes, if we have a positive pool and there's 10 members in that pool, we reflex test those 10 members with the Binex now. Got it. And in order to do that, then uh, that information will be put through Project Beacon, which is through the state. Okay, thank you. Brad, do you have a comment? No, I think, I think Lynn captured. I was going to ask Katrina. So I was wondering if we might then end up with another data line much like we do for the other testing where we remove out the, um, the university testing, but it sounds like because it's pooled testing, it wouldn't, but, and um, I think I understand it. Yeah. Lynn's, Lynn's explanation makes a lot more sense to me. I was trying to figure out how that would count to the town. So this, that's actually the most clear scenario I could come up with too. So I'm glad it was confirmed. But we'll um, the, the, the denominator, I guess, but only by those who are taking the reflex test, not the ones in the pool. Yeah, we could probably do some math and take out the students from the town and see what we could do some math to figure uh, out. If yeah. <laughs> I think we need to keep in mind, like the reason that they pull the college tests out is because those are individual tests and it's mass testing. It's a lot of tests on a population that is going to skew towards negative because they're just doing so many tests of so many people. Our Binex now testing numbers will no, come nowhere near rivaling it. So the addition of those number of tests to the denominator and the numerator are going to be statistically meaningless in the overall count at the state level. It's just that's just a, that's just the way it's going to be. And even, even, if, even if we level. had even if we had multiple positive pools, even if half of our pools tested positive every week, which is unlikely. Even all those Binex now tests is a teen, not even a drop. It's a it's a piece of a drop into the pool of individual testing that's going on across the state. So it's it's not going to be meaningful. Yeah, the state does like a hundred thousand tests a day. Yeah. <laughs> it's like a lot. Yeah. So um, I might have inflated that, but they do a lot right. of testing. So we're right. our little impact from school isn't going right. to blow anyone right. out of the water. 
Cool. All right. Thank you, Katrina. Appreciate it. Uh, we'll see you next time. <laughs> All right. Uh, next, we're going to have an update on finances from Steve Mark. Sorry, I forgot to unmute. Um, so if they can pull up that slide. Thank you. Um, so um, this is the report. This is through January. Um, um, the last report was December. So this is January. Um, so a couple of things to note here. So, so uh, our year-to-date um, percent use, the, that 40% number, that's a little light um, for, for normally where we are this time of year. Uh, so we're, we're looking into uh, what we're missing. Um, there's a couple of things to note. Um, we just processed our retroactive payments for uh, the teachers. Uh, now that that contract is settled, we had to go back and make that retroactive payments. Uh, that payment will hit in February. So that number is not reflected in this number. Um, so that's our, um, I, I think that was a little under $100,000. I don't remember exactly that, that number. Um, our SPED numbers, um, I, to be honest with you, I don't have an answer at this point in time. We're just running that analysis and seeing why that's a, that's a, little, um, a, a little light at 28%, 29%. Uh, that should be a little higher at this point in time in the year. So uh, we'll, we're checking on those. Um, I have a sneaky suspicion that we're behind in receiving some of the invoices for, from some of our service providers. Uh, some of those service providers, that their staff are working from home and uh, working remotely. And, and we've noticed a little bit of time lag in getting some of those, uh, but we're, I don't wanna say that's what it is, but that's what I suspect it is. And we're doing that analysis to, to find out um, where we're at on that. Uh, and I'll work with Lynn Snow on, on those costs as well. Um, other than that, I mean, it's, it's good news, I guess, in the fact that we're a little light on the actual spending versus running uh, heavy on the expenditures at this point in time. So um, no surprises. Um, the, the transportation, um, uh, that's a little light as well because we're, we're definitely missing, um, our, our transportation providers are definitely running a, a little behind in getting their invoices to us. Um, so that's the, the true year-to-day cost are not reflected in that number. Um, the student and staff, staff support number is a little light and I think we're seeing uh, some of the savings uh, in um, because we're not running uh, a lot of after-school activities and a lot of, uh, as Mike Lynn pointed out, uh, their the schedules have been lighter. So we're not uh, incurring some of those transportation costs uh, that normally come out of that line. So um, things like that, that's, that's kind of what's going on in the budget. Again, it's good news in the sense that we're running a little light on the, on the um, year-to-date expenditures, the actuals versus um, going the opposite way. So I guess it's good news. Um, and, um, like I said, I, I look, we'll look into the special education and find out why that's uh, running um, uh, only at 29% uh, where we expected that to be a little bit higher at this point in time. Uh, and then uh, report back out to school committee when I have some answers. N any questions? And I'm sorry, I don't have that information at this point in time, but can, can I answer any questions or? Steve, where are we? So we're at 40.3. Uh, you mentioned that we're maybe a little light. Where are we supposed to be around 50% right now? Yeah, we normally at this time in time, you were in the 50 to 50, 55% uh, expended range. Um, so it's a little light. Is there any, any uh, concern that the categories at 57 and 59% might go over a hundred percent this year? Do we have extra spending in those categories? We, we're no, ahead? not not yet. Um, uh, again, the, the system administration, that's a little higher because if you remember um, that the year starts uh, July 1, that's when those expenses hit. And uh, a lot of the, the regular yeah. education and special education staff, those salaries really start September 1. So um, there's a little bit of uh, so they're on pace. difference on that. So, yeah. Thank you. All right. Anybody else? Okay. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Steve. All right. Next, we're going to get a presentation on the initial rollout of the pool testing program. As uh, I mentioned earlier this evening, we finished our second round of pool testing today. 
Our, our students did a fantastic, <clears throat> excuse me, a fantastic job. Uh, our littles uh, were, were troopers. Uh, uh, the, the test that we're using is, is, is non-invasive. Uh, if you remember back to when they first started COVID-19 testing, the uh, swab was at times an unpleasant process <clears throat> with the, the system or technique we're using this year. <clears throat> excuse me, it, it, uh, it, it's certainly non-invasive and it's like a, almost a tickle in the nose. So our students were uh, quite relieved when they, they found out how easy it was to do. Uh, we provided a, a few slides this evening to kind of review what we've done this week. Uh, this time I'm going to turn it over to, to Ms. Snow to go over those slides. Thank you, Dr. Clenchy. Um, so for tonight's update, I just really wanted to um, give everybody a picture and an experience of what pool testing is like. Um, I feel like when we started this venture, uh, I, I was really looking for content or I was really looking for uh, visuals and wanted to kind of visualize what this was going to be like because it was something that really schools haven't ever encountered. Um, so I've just provided uh, some pictures and I'll just kind of talk through them. So Dorothy, if you want to go on to the next slide, that would be great. The most important thing I want to share is um, please thank your nurses. The nurses have been incredible. Um, they have had to rapid fire, um, go through trainings, they have had to um, jump onto webinars while still also doing their day to day operations. And they've, they've done it with, um, you know, grace and confidence, and they really have led the charge. And I, I am so incredibly impressed with the team of nurses that we have in Littleton. Um, Mary Philpot, who has taken on our uh, role as testing coordinator has done an incredible job. And we also uh, want to thank Jen Pletcher, who has um, jumped in to assist us with the te pool testing collections as well. It has really helped make everything go as smoothly as possible. So for the next slide, um, one, one thing that we were kind of um, thrown at the 11th hour is that we were um, given quick start kits rather than the full, um, the full testing supplies. So we needed to kind of do a little bit of, um, a little bit of work and a little bit of encouragement so that they were able to give us the full supplies because we were ready for the full rollout. Um, so we, we did that. So Dorothy, if you wanna go on to the next slide. And so um, just to give you a visual of, of what these quick start kits entail, um, it really is just the testing tube where the swabs go in. I was expecting something a lot bigger <laughs> when we got the quick start kits and they were these very small boxes uh, because all they really do need to do is hold 10 cotton swabs and go inside uh, the tube, which is the pool. And so they provided us with a step-by-step -step guide for the process of the nasal swab. And then we also had been given uh, a lot of guidance around the PPE and what we needed in, in order to make the process be as streamlined as possible. So if you wanna take us to the next slide. Um, so we set up kit, kits for each of the schools, which I think really kind of helped the process as well. So every, every school was really able to kind of quick start. They had what they needed at their fingertips and we had a lot of conversations about how the process would flow at each school. And, and as Dr. Clenchy said, the process is slightly different at each of the schools, taking into consideration students' developmental levels, scheduling, and um, the best, mo most uh, efficient way to uh, accomplish the collection. So we have a, a little bit of a different process at each school, so I, I'll give a quick overview of, of that. Um, this, I think I shared this with our update to parents too, but it really is a very simple process to collect the anterior nasal swab, very simple. And it was really great to see, we had been told that students in grades two and, and above were going to be able to do it independently, but it was nice to be able to see that that actually was the case and that all of our students were able to do it successfully and, um, in, and independently for the most part. So in the middle school, that is the school that we started first thing in the morning. They do their collection right, they come right out the gate at, at 7 a.m. 
And so uh, what we found too, is that less is more. So having kind of less people involved in the process kind of helped things move efficiently. We had originally planned to have uh, three stations set up essentially in um, kind of static locations. And after having some conversations, Kathy did a great job really kind of like thinking it through and they decided to adjust it a little bit. And so our um, seventh and eighth graders are collected during their flex block when they first get to school. And then our sixth graders were collecting their specimens. The first few minutes are the beginning part of their UA, which is the first block. So the whole collection of the entire school is able to be done essentially within inside of um, about a half hour. So after we did our first collection on Monday, we, you know, debriefed and processed and found that we were actually going to, um, going forward, probably split up into to two carts and be able to kind of divide and conquer and have it, have it get completed even more efficiently. Um, so that uh, middle school went really well, went really smoothly and um, was very well received. We were able to capture the staff and the students pretty easily. At Russell Street, uh, Cheryl had embraced pool testing. She is a pro testing, uh, pool testing pro. And so she had really done a lot of kind of front end work, kind of just determining what would be the most, most efficient process for her building. And so at Russell Street, they go from classroom to classroom in the morning and they're able to pull out a, a group of students, do a quick swab collection and then have them scoot right back into their classrooms. And they did a beautiful job too. And we found that the most challenging part of the process is just opening the swab. <laughs> it's you opening it like a cheese stick. And that was probably the toughest step. Um, Russell Street's did a really, really great job. They got through their first collection, probably, I want to say in less than an hour. I think maybe it was 45 minutes. We were, we did have some impact uh, of the collection from weather. I guess there was some students that had um, opted remote on Monday due to weather and commuting in the morning. So we did have a lighter collection than we anticipated. Um, Shaker Lane. Shaker Lane required uh, a few more hands on deck because of our little ones that need assistance, but that was also able to, they were able to get through the whole process pretty quickly and efficiently as well. Um, Thursday is a lighter collection. They were able to collect the, all of the pools within a half hour. Monday, it was about an hour. The high school, we had a, a little bit of a different setup where we have the collections uh, set up during the three lunches. And then the students who have consented, Keith and John are um, going into the cafeteria, making announcements, making sure that they're reminding our teenagers that if they um, are participating in pool testing to scoot down to the gym, same thing with the staff, the staff needed the same reminders. <laughs> but after um, going through the first collection on Monday, we were able to kind of adjust the process a little bit too. So we having the the space of the gym has been amazing because we were able to really spread um, the individuals out. They We had little, as you can see in the, the picture, little station set up with the, the swabs, the hand sanitizer, the tissue so they can blow their nose, a large printed out step-by-step -step guide. So the, the high school um, it had a visual to go through the steps so we didn't have to kind of repeat it each time somebody came in. And then they just would kind of check in and check out and we would add them to a pool. And it was also really efficient. We were able to, to get through um, each group during the three lunches and there was kind of time left over in between each lunch. So there wasn't a backlog or people waiting or um, late getting back to their, their class. It really kind of went pretty quickly. We also are including central office staff. They are getting populated into pools randomly throughout the district. And so they were troopers as well, getting their collection. If you wanna take us to the next one. And then for the um, reflex testing, should we need that? We were able to get kits for each of the schools. So we do have Binex Now um, antigen test kits 
on hand at each of the schools as well as central office so that we do have the ability to very quickly and efficiently reflex test um, should we have a positive pool. Um, this is what the, the pools look like when we turn them in. All the tubes get registered into the portal. They're, they're labeled, they're coded, they're, they have a, a, a specific memo for each of the pools that all gets cross-referenced where we, we keep pool sheets um, on hand, hard copies and electronic of all the members of the pool. So we're able to reference back to who is included in each of the pools. And then just to give you a little snapshot of how things went this week, as of the deadline to turn in consents, we had 501 consents that came in uh, before the deadline. For collection one, we collected 237 samples. We submitted 38 pools. We had no positive pools. For collection two today, we um, collected 210 samples. We submitted 29 pools and our um, results are pending. They were dropped off this afternoon. Um, I will say that the number of pools decreased because we are, we have kind of figured out the estimated number of, of students and how to populate those pools. So we're getting um, to those real targeted numbers. We want to have somewhere between five and we need to have somewhere between five and 10, but the majority of our pools today ranged um, between like six and a lot of them were eights and nines where during the first collection, we had um, a couple with that were, you know, fours. Um, and so we were able to really kind of make that more consistent. Um, we, so we had some, we had less samples collected that was due to absences, students who had um, shifted to remote either for the day, um, students who were remote because of, of weather. And um, we did have a few, we had a few consents that had been um, submitted, but then withdrawn. A couple parents thought they needed to fill it out regardless. Um, so that kind of skewed our numbers a little bit. Um, moving forward, right as of right now, we have 643 consents. So we have, we have had some consents come in um, since the, the deadline for the first collection. So we are anticipating to uh, collect 643 samples the week after February vacation. And that's all we have. Mike, you muted. <laughs> Brad, go ahead. Yeah, Lynn, thank you so much for that. It was really, really helpful. I have a couple of questions that kind of build on our conversations from, from last time. Um, first of all, I like that we're already adjusting the process and you said you're making changes from day one to day two and from school to school. Um, it seems based on my reading of what you were just saying that this wasn't disruptive to the education. That was one of the concerns we had. Is that how you'd characterize it? Um, I, I didn't perceive it as, as disruptive. I think I, I would want to put that out to the principals and get their input in case they got feedback from, from the teachers. I, I saw it as a pretty efficient streamlined process that really didn't disrupt because that we really were in, in and out of classrooms inside of, I would say what Cheryl, four, four minutes, five minutes. Could do the principals mind commenting on that? Is that, have, was that your sense that even in this first day, first time when it's probably a rougher roll up than it's going to be that we were able to manage without disrupting the education? Is that fair? Yeah. Um, just, just speaking for Russell street when we, um, so currently we're going around to each classroom with a cart. Um, we have maybe uh, five or fewer kids come out from a classroom and the process takes about a minute and a half, seriously, blow your nose, sanitize your hands, open the thing, put it up your nose, miss, somebody tells you which tube to put it in, put it, sanitize your hands, go back to class. So the kids are super quick. There's no lines, there's no waiting. So if individual classes, you know, the time that an individual student was out of class was less than two minutes. And we, we left right at the beginning of the day. We start right after morning announcements. So for about half of the building, we're going to 12 classes. For about six classes, it's during their morning meeting. So they're not doing their academic work yet. Um, and for the other six classes, they've start between 8.30 and 9 o'clock. I, 
um, assume the process when we're not teaching students how to do it will become more automatic. We'll stream, I won't have to say anything to them in the next rounds. They'll know what they're doing and they'll just come out and do it and go back. So the answer is no, it's not disruptive at all. Well, that's great. Then that's consistent with I think what Salem was reporting to us in the video and in person. Um, so thank you for that. I had a question about um, about the staffing needs. We we were predicting that we could we could staff this and handle it as a system. One week in, are we where we need to be? Do we how do we feel about that? We actually, I think we overestimated the staff thing that we need. Um, we did find, I think we had had planned in our kind of schematic from the last meeting that we would need uh, an additional nurse and two support staff. The additional nurse has been has been crucial and critical and, and, and wonderful. Um, and I think that with that going forward now that everybody knows the process, I mean, I was I was present for all, all of the collections. I don't know that I will need to be continue to be present for all of the collections. Um, so I think we were. Um, thankfully, we we over we overshot that. I think that um, you know we'll have to we'll have to see how that how that unfolds today. For instance, um, we had two nurses out, mm -hmm. and so we had to use um, we had to use our our nurse um, who is who we had slated to help with um, the collection to us to cover in a health clinic. Um, but thanks to um, Ms. Steele, Ms. Steele and I were able to fill in for, for those roles and go out to the schools and assist with the collections. Great, Great thank you. Um, we also had questions before this started about turnaround time, about, you know, if we get the test in on, you know, submit them Monday, mid morning, Monday, noon, would we have, when would we get the results back? Can you give us a little sense about how that's working? Yes, absolutely, because I hand delivered them on Monday and, and today <laughs> so that we could get a really good sense of that. So because it was the first time, I have to say that the most time consuming kind of labor intensive thing is following following the collection, we then have to reconcile and make sure all of our pool sheets are fully accurate, that we've got, um, we, we have to make sure we've got the right number of samples that match the pool sheet, that match the code. Um, and then we have to register all of those tubes online. And so then we have to package them all up to uh, get on the road. And so that, that, and when I say time consuming, thanks to being able to figure out how to use a barcode scanner, which is also a new skill that I have now, um, mm -hmm. that made it much more efficient because they sent barcode scanners um, with the quick start kit. So once I figured out how to use a barcode scanner, that made it a lot easier um, to just get all of the tubes registered because then all you had to do was just enter um, the memo, the number of swabs in your name because you're attaching yourself to that. So um, that did take longer just logistically on the first day. So we didn't get, I didn't deliver our, our specimens until I want to say 4.30. Our results came in the next day at 1.50 p.m. That's great. That, that's good to know. It may, that may change as the, as the labs are handling more capacity, but that's still, that's, that's, that's 18 hours or so. That's good. Yeah, And that's and, and getting them in at four 30 really was not advised. They, they said, get them in before that. You don't want to be getting them in between that four and six hour. Cause that's when all the, the, the specimens from the colleges and universities are getting in. So um, I did drop them off today at two 30, which was great. Um, so I'm eager to, um, find out when we, when we get our results. Yeah. I think those reports will be helpful for us just, just to know. And my final question then I promise to be quiet is the participation rates. Um, if I took the notes correctly, 492 students, 155 staff, the staff rate sounds like that's a really high participation rate. And we appreciate the staff um, stepping up and doing that. The student rate is, can you help me figure out what percentage that is? If we were hoping for 70 or 80%, that my guess is that number is low. Yeah, Kelly and I were, to, were crunching those numbers the other day, and I think we're around kind of, Kelly, 55-ish percent, and that's kind of on target with a lot of the other districts when they first started, um, and then the, the consents have been shown to kind of increase as, as the weeks go along. I, I'd like to see that. I'd like to hope that after tonight and people familiar, are familiar with the process and, and see that it's, it's not, um, you know, it's not... It's not labor intensive, time consuming. Students aren't spending a lot of time out of class that maybe we'll get more consents. I would love to, I would love for us as a district to be at that 80% because I think then it will really make the data meaningful. 
we're currently at 55%. Uh, you know, part of it is there's a bit of mystery involved when you, you introduce something new and, and some of our older students uh, obviously have, have either experienced or, or know somebody that experienced the, the uh, beginning COVID-19 tests with the, the uh, intrusive swab, so to speak, also known as the brain swab. So today at noon at the high school, I had a few students, uh, they were a little apprehensive at first and, until they found out that it was just a, a small uh, nasal swab. So all of those things are gonna help uh, people feel more comfortable taking part in the pool testing program. So I really do anticipate that our numbers are gonna increase with time. I hope so too, but thank you very much for the presentation. All right, anybody else? Justin? Um, Lynn, thanks very much and great job. And Brad, thank you for asking most of my questions already. <laughs> um, I was just wanted to drive home the, the point about, do we have a plan for educating the families to try to increase participation? I'm not, I'm not looking to flip anyone. If they are adamantly against testing, that's fine. It's an opt-in program. But this week, I mean, I know the turnaround time was, was, uh, was tight and, hey, we pulled it off and that's great. But I think that there are still some folks that have questions about what kind of swab is it? Um, how does the quarantining thing work? When can I get retested? And I'm just thinking if we can make those uh, answers available to folks in like multiple um, formats that naturally participation is going to go up. But if we can help move that along, it would be great to get some greater participation as we return from February break. I'd love to see that number going up. So I'm just wondering if other districts have shared what they've done and if we plan to do anything. Sure. So um, I, I, we sent out a, a pretty detailed kind of pool testing update the first week. We will be sending out information weekly. And I think it, it might be a great idea for us to maybe do a, a couple open forums for parents that want to uh, ask questions. I'm certainly available to answer questions. It's, it's been nice because a lot of, a lot of parents have reached out. They have they have sent a lot of emails kind of asking for more information, which has been wonderful um, to be able to kind of share, you know, share those answers singularly, but it would be nice to be able to do it in, in, a, in a forum so that groups of parents that maybe a parent asks a question that another one's not thinking of. Was that a meeting yesterday with 27 other districts? And uh, at the end of the meeting, we sent all of our materials to those districts. We were ahead of the game, so to speak. So there's, there, you know, we haven't found a district that, that uh, uh, has usable materials at this point in time, but we can certainly put something together. You also have to remember that uh, the best kind of advertising is through word of mouth as well. Once they find out what the test is all about and it's not intrusive at all, it's quick. Uh, uh, I mean, that, that's, that's, half the story right there. But as Lynn pointed out, we'll, we'll hold some forums if necessary. And, and uh, we're certainly available to answer any questions that people have. All right. Thank you. Tim and Matt. Matt. Well, I just want to say, I think it was a great presentation, Lynn. And uh, I'm really glad to see that it went smoothly this week. Um, there's, there's a lot of <laughs> different uh, moving parts that you guys had to get going. And I think it's great that we're, we're able to do it. I know my, my kids missed out on it because of the uh, remote day Tuesday, but uh, they definitely um, were looking forward to participating in it. And I think that it's a, uh, it's great. Any mitigation factors we can add, like the pool testing is going to help us get more kids into the school sooner. So um, just keep up the good work. Timlin. You good? I'm good. I think they all asked my questions. Thank okay. you. Thank you, Lynn. Yeah. Uh, thank you to everyone for the, the incredibly uh, rapid ramp up. Um, I think that personally it's advantageous that we got a little bit of a dry run this week, then we can take a break and you guys can go back and, and, and think about it and, and visualize how you can make the improvements. So I anticipate that even though we, we probably will have increased participation, that even with that, I think we'll continue to be uh, pushing those turnaround times down. Um, and I'm very much looking forward to seeing uh, a set of data over a couple of weeks 
um, that will allow us to start making more informed decisions about where we are in terms of uh, asymptomatic uh, transmission through the schools. I think that's going to be a, a great data point. Um, so thank you, everyone. Take a break this week, and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll jump right back into the pool of pool testing uh, in a week. All right. All right. Uh, next on the agenda, we need to talk about what we're going to do coming back from the break that we have been mentioning. Um, we uh, have had two holiday breaks prior. We didn't uh, go remote coming out of Thanksgiving. We saw a spike in uh, both the community rates and the uh, in-school rates. Uh, we did take a break uh, after Christmas and uh, the we did see again a, a little bit of a spike while we were out. It wasn't as significant uh, in the in-school rates as it was during the Thanksgiving break. Um, and now we need to decide if we, we want to do that again or if we, we don't. Uh, I'm going to open it to the school committee for uh, comments, questions, or suggestions. Matt? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of torn on, on this. I, I'm kind of want to, um, see what happens if we just all come back, um, as normal after the break. Um, I feel like at this point, the numbers are going down, uh, and we haven't seen a lot of in-school transmission. Uh, I just hate to take away some more in-person learning at this time, but Again, I'm, I'm torn on it because I, I do think it's a, another mitigation strategy that we can implement, but I'd be happy to hear from my other board members to see their thoughts or hear their thoughts. Justin? Yeah, um, I just I pulled up the long-term forecast. It looks like we're going to have some snow days to start that week coming back. Um, just kidding. Um, <laughs> Why is that? I... I I, uh, I think that it's okay to come back. I think that we've got enough uh, mitigation strategies in place. And I think that the community understands how important it is that um, they need to follow the guidelines. They need to mask. They need to distance. They need to not let their guard down because uh, I'm not, I mean, I don't think I'm kidding. I think if that if we come back and we have a massive amount of cases, we're going to end up taking steps back. And no one on this panel, no one in the agenda, the audience tonight, I think wants to start taking steps backwards. So I'm, I'm all for return with the current um, cohort model immediately following break. But again, just with like with the sports, we've got to make sure we're doing everything we can to make sure that we don't uh, slip up and we keep these numbers trending in the right direction. Okay. Come on. Yeah, I have to agree with Justin. Um, I think I'd be okay with coming back hybrid, mainly because we've now got the testing in place. I mean, we did the attestation forms in November, and the numbers went up, and there wasn't there were cases that we saw, and then we did the staying home remote after December, and the cases there were still a few cases the the two weeks after. So I mean, with this one more with the with the testing in place, I really think we can come back hybrid. I would support it. And especially where these kids have missed few snow days this month to get them back in, in front of a teacher would be good. Hopefully mm -hmm. Justin's forecast isn't right for those <laughs> early snow days. Brad. Well, I believe Justin, I think he took a Facebook poll on it and, um, <laughs> <laughs> and learned what's going to happen. Uh, I, I agree with my colleagues. Uh, I don't, I was thinking about the attestation form. Um, Timmel makes a good point about if the numbers are roughly the same after Thanksgiving with the form as they were for the two weeks after, um, after the winter break without it, then let's give the staff a break and not, and not collect this. As Justin said, we're, we're all trying to make this work. If people screw it up, then it's screwed up. Um, let's be safe as we can be. Let's double mask. Let's do what we can. And see what happens if we do this, um, just run it back um, when we come back. Because, you know, I think the conversation we're about to have is about um, maybe switching different models or, or reconsidering the model we have. Those two weeks of data of, that we're going to get um, when we come back, 
um, will be really important to what we can do and what we can consider. So I, I, um, I'm in favor of returning in the hybrid model as it's currently cons constructed um, and hope people um, make good decisions. Okay, thank you everyone. I, I agree. I, I think that uh, this break is a little different. I know that there's a holiday on Monday, President's Day, but I mean, it, that's not the same type of social holiday that Thanksgiving and Christmas are. Uh, I think this February vacation in terms of what people are planning on is going to be significantly curtailed uh, this year compared to what we normally see in terms of trips and travel and, and you know, chances to get away. Um, and I think that after seeing the, the, the lessons learned coming out between uh, what happened after Thanksgiving and what happened after Christmas, I'm optimistic that the impact of, uh, you know, increased community cases and increased cases in school will be at a manageable level uh, that, that will be okay. And I think, Brad, you bring a good, good point. I really don't want to lose a week of opportunity to gather data to inform us um, as we move towards the spring and better weather the, in, in, the, in getting a chance to see what the data from the testing program, how that can inform our decision making as we move forward. So I think we clearly have a consensus uh, to come back uh, on the Monday after the break, it, the same way we've been coming back, uh, or just like a normal week, normal being a relative term, obviously. Um, I don't think that at this point, because we're going to make any changes, that actually requires a vote. I think we have consensus and the uh, administration understands the direction that we're uh, asking them to take. Uh, so I appreciate that. I do see a hand up, uh, Dorothy, for yes. input. Matthew Ridge, please state your name, your street, and your question, please. 325 Great Road, uh, Matthew Ridge. Uh, quick question. Uh, we had, talking about snow days, we had sort of a gimme snow day that just happened. Um, are we going to be a little more cautious about calling a snow day when uh, something like when we pretty much don't get snow until like, I don't know, 11 o'clock noon, because uh, the, not to mention, we got that notification in less than 12 hours, like uh, not even 24 hours notification that we were going to have this snow day. Uh, our works, I don't know about anybody else's employer, but I can tell you right now, my employer's on their last line, last, uh, last nerve when it comes to uh, last minute Lucy's. Uh, we need to be careful with this because a lot of people are going to start losing their jobs if we keep on getting last minute notifications without any provocation, especially with how this last snow day that we had, we had less than an inch of snow, maybe two inches. I mean... I, yeah, I appreciate it, Matthew. It was, it was obviously frustrating in that respect, but that was a tricky one. The timing of in the projection of the snowfall accumulation was clearly erroneous in hindsight, uh, but the projections were uniform that it was going to be significantly more snow than we actually got. But it wasn't, you know, that the, the, the accumulation of snow was one factor, but it was the timing of the, the snowfall. Uh, Dr. Clinch, do you want to speak to, to the decision making you had in, in regards to this particular storm? I'd like to know where you got your information from, because it, all <laughs> the services I was watching from pretty much said we were going to get a powdering. So that's why I, was that's, sort of uh, I saw a lot different ones than that. And uh, Dr. Clinch actually sent to me exactly what he got, which is did not say dusting. But go ahead, Dr. Clinchy. Things have changed dramatically in the 32 years I've been responsible for closing schools. The, the information we get uh, from forecasters is, is usually pretty accurate, but we're dealing with, with Mother Nature, and it's a prediction. Uh, that last storm you're referring to, uh, they were pretty consistent right up to 6 and 7 in the morning. We were, we were expected to get uh, 6 to 8 inches, and... Uh, then midday, they, they obviously uh, realized that that wasn't going to happen. I have to tell you, that doesn't happen very often. But uh, I also am going to say that, that I have the responsibility to make sure that I do everything I can to keep our students and staff safe. Uh, this year is a bit of an anomaly. Usually you get a phone call at 5 in the morning. But because we're, we're uh, in, a, in a year where, where uh, 
we're offering different learning models. And if we have a remote day, our, our, our staff need time to prepare. Our, our families need some time to, to, to work out uh, the, the arrangements for the day. We're, we're calling uh, these days much earlier than we typically do. So again, uh, I'm just worried that a lot of our employers are not going to not going to be tolerant as much as they have been in the past because uh, it's just becoming to a point where we are starting to see some pushback on our end. I don't know about anybody else, but we're starting to see some pushback. They're like, well, you just can't keep doing this. And we're like, we're stuck. We have no choice. Yeah, well, we appreciate that. So a lot of us are facing the similar issues uh, with our own personal circumstances. Um, but the fact of the matter is we are still in a pandemic. So we, we, while we're cognizant of that, the decisions that we're making are driven primarily by the health and safety uh, decisions and the pressures that that put on all of us is something that we're just going to have to hang in there with uh, until we drive the pandemic down to where it doesn't affect us the way it has been. All right. I'm just, I, it's no, just, we appreciate it. Yep. I'm just worried. That's all. Yep. Because yep, we are too. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Next question, Chairman Fontenelle. Yep. Carrie Lavoy, please state your name, your question, and your street, please. Hi, my name is Carrie Lavoy, and I'm at Three Stony Stream Lane. And I have a question of um, my children are in cohort A. So in the last two weeks, they've missed three out of the four days that they were able to go in. Um, I just want to know how we're going to make those up, because right now, every day in person is so much more important than it's ever been. So the, the actual snow day where there was no instruction for any students um, will be made up at the end of the year. And we, we've asked the administration to ensure that that is an in-person learning day for cohort A because they were the ones that would have been in the buildings on that particular snow day. Um, we'll continue to, to, to watch the balance of missed in-person learning days as we kind of get towards the tail end of winter here. And if we see a significant inequity uh, in terms of number of days missed by one cohort versus another, um, we'll definitely take a look at it. One thing to keep in mind is that uh, we've had a Monday holiday recently, but the holiday schedule over the course of the year actually works out to an equal number of Thursday, Friday holidays and, and Monday, Tuesday holidays. Um, so we are keeping an eye on it. And, uh, you know, depending no, on I, tr I, I totally understand that, um, you know, snow days happen, things happen. But I do know since January, my daughters have only had six in person days. And that is, that's hard. That's very hard on young elementary kids. These kids are the studies, the studies are showing are the ones that need to be prioritized to get into these buildings and into in person learning. And our children have had six in person days. And a remote day, is not the same as an in-person day. And that remote day should be made up with an in-person day for cohort A. They had a remote day, a snow day, and then another snow day. <laughs> Those are not the same types of days, remote versus in-person. My children are not excited to go to a remote day. They're excited to go into the building and see their classmates and their teachers face to face. Masks and all. My kids don't care about wearing a mask. They care about being in the building. And I'm sorry, a remote day does not equal an in-person learning day. Yep, we, we agree with that wholeheartedly. And another thing is replacing my in-person day midwinter with a gorgeous sunny day that my children would rather be outside and play when the schools are 80 degrees, now with a mask, is not any sort of quality learning. That is not, the, that is not a day okay. for a day. Well, snow days are made up. We can't pick which day we make up the snow day, what, what the weather's going to be on that snow day, on that day. And I'm not asking you to, but I am asking okay. you to make it. My, my child, my cohort A children, 
a priority to make up those days before the end of the year. Okay. And to understand that six in-person days for a first grader is not appropriate in an entire, in two whole months. Okay, thank you. All right, uh, next on the agenda, under new business, um, we would like to start to have a discussion here on a review of the COVID-19 learning models. Um, thinking about this, you know, as a school committee, I think we recognize based on the uh, metric updates that we get at each of our meetings that the COVID infection rates, which spiked dramatically after being pretty low in September and October, we saw a significant rise in November, December, in January, now seem to be trending down. Um, they're still significantly higher than they were in September and October, but we're definitely seeing improvements. Uh, in, in the meantime, we've also had the uh, initial rollout of our testing program. And obviously, we're every week, we're getting better news about the vaccine rollout, uh, although it has been frustrating to this point that you know, it hasn't been better. Uh, in the in the previous months, but it seems like it's starting to accelerate. So given all of those factors, uh, I think it's appropriate that as a school committee, we start to think about if there are opportunities to uh, increase in-person learning and uh, evaluate some ideas such as reevaluating uh, or taking another look at the use, uh, current use of our classroom space, thinking about the remote only Wednesdays, uh, possibly reevaluating our cohort structure. And through that discussion, thinking about what we want to have the administration do in terms of a process and, and timelines for uh, taking a, a look at what the alternatives might be, what the impacts would be, and what we think is possible. Um, so given that, I would like to open it up to the school committee to see what they're thinking. Uh, and then probably incorporate um, feedback from the administration and the principals and the superintendent. Uh, and then we'll see if there's any public comment as well. Matt, I see you've got your hand up. Yeah, thanks, Mike. Um, I want to increase the number of days the kids can learn in person. I, I definitely do. I think um, I think we got to start being a little bit more creative um, and how we do that. Um, you know, certain things have to happen. Um, we saw that uh, Karina's uh, model of the, the mitigating strategies that we have. And if one thing, if we put all the kids in, we're going to be losing the six feet. Um, that's something we can look at further down the line, I think. But for right now, I feel like we need to look at both uh, Shaker Lane and Russell Street for the K to five and see if there's any more kids that we can fit in there on the in-person learning days. Um, whether that's, you know, I know that we, like I said, we can't add all the kids in, but if we can get up to 60% of the kids in during those days, 70%, um, just really evaluate the space because, and then I don't know how you choose those kids, whether it's a lottery system, <coughs> uh, see what kids want to, participate, get the kids in there a little bit more. Uh, but I would like to see us trying to get, so especially the K to five in three days a week um, for right now. The other thing that I just want to say that I think a lot of people are going to feel a lot more comfortable once teachers get vaccinated. And this sounds a little self-serving being that I'm a teacher, but for all those in the audience who want us to get those kids back in school, call your state Senator, call your state congressman, tell them to get the teachers vaccinated because that's going to make our job a lot easier to get these kids back in the school. All right. Thanks, Matt. Anybody else? Brad? Yeah, I've been, thanks, Mike. Um, I didn't think about this. So we had kind of two months at the beginning of all this to just kind of see how our systems would work and if the hybrid model would work. Um, it was. And then we had a two month surge of extremely high cases and we've been able to weather that generally well. Now it looks like the, um, and to, to learn from our model and to learn from others, now it looks like the numbers are kind of settling in right around the, the, the 
pre-Thanksgiving part. And I think it is time to, to look for more options. Um, we've learned from our experience. We've learned from what other people are doing. We're, we're referencing studies that show with, with mitigation strategies in place that we have in place that we can do this. I'm with Matt. I think that it's, it's, it would be really helpful. And I don't know if we need a, you know, to reinstate it and reinstitute a task force kind of approach we used before um, with administration and parents and school members and teachers were all involved or if we um, just ask the administration to do this. But my sense is that the two weeks after school are gonna matter. Um, it, after we come back, will matter. But at that point, we'll have three weeks of pool testing data, not only from our school, but from districts. So we can kind of corroborate our results and compare them to theirs. Um, and we, that would give us three-ish, three, four weeks, three weeks to, to come up with some plans for us to consider um, about how to, you know, to the same goals Matt has more kids in more time. Um, I think it's, we're at the point in the school system and at the point in kind of our experience where it's, um, I think we should be looking at, at more options and we can spend the next two weeks after the vacation coming up with plans so we can debate and then implement if we decide to move forward and if the data supports it. But for me, what I, you know, I think the six feet, it remains important to me. Maybe the CDC guidance that comes out tomorrow will be different and help me to think differently. But right now that seems really important. And um, we've done airflow audits before. Um, I'd like another one just to, to make sure our systems still are working with capacity and see if they're working. Steve, you can correct me if I'm wrong. But I think we did those airflow audits um, before we had the additional filters in. Um, as we get into March, um, in mid-March and after, we'll probably be able to open the windows again um, or keep them open. Um, I'm not anticipating the airflow will be um, an issue but I, I'd like to be certain that it is um, not going to be an issue, so we can we can make some plans. Um, so uh, we did an airflow test in. I don't remember the dates. Uh, we did it earlier in their uh, October November time frame, if I recall, and then That's we call, yeah. tested it again in uh, in Jan January. Yep. But for I mean, if we're what would be helpful for me as we're gonna make decisions, assuming that maybe I'm wrong, but I assume we're gonna ask administration or, or volunteer to participate in creating, kind of looking at different models or ways to tweak the existing model. What will be important for me to know is I think we were, those airflow models were based on a certain capacity in the room. Um, I wanna see like what, what can these rooms tolerate um, within the guidelines that, that we've agreed to. Um, but I wanna see, you know, what, what are the limits here that we can that we can safely do keeping the public health standards right. or the school health standards we've had before. I'm as I understand it, I think that's that's definitely worthwhile. But as I understand it, it's not going to require another evaluation. It's going to require looking at the data that we got and 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 crunching it and saying you know because because the the systems don't change. They didn't change. They're still the same system. So the numbers that were measured you can then take and then it's just to say, well, with, you know, 10 people in the room, you're getting this much uh, air exchange with 15 people, you're getting this much with 18, you're getting that much. And you can see if it still meets the minimum thresholds that are recommended by the various, uh, you know, advisory groups. Right. What, and I, and I, I remember healthy. that now, but I, Steve, I wasn't sure if those, if the evaluation in January included or factored in the, the new filters we bought and put in all the rooms and if they factored in, um, like opening the windows, what to, to what yeah. degree that that helps? They 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 don't factor in open windows because that's the idea. It's like you want to see what the worst case scenario is. Like what what's the minimum airflow you've got when you can't open the windows? And then it, we didn't have all the HEPA filters in and installed when the technician in running because the building was kind of empty when he was in there. He was doing it mostly over February, over our Christmas break. Um, so, you know, the, the way to think about it is we can look and see what the, the numbers without, uh, you know, in reinforced airflow, either by open windows and HEPA filters are. And the other thing is, I think we could easily ask Ken Beck from uh, BLW Engineering to chime in on what the addition of those HEPA filters means um, and, and see if we can get some information from that. I think it's definitely a, a good exercise to go through as part of this planning 
um, because I think that's the type of assurance that we would need as a committee and as a community to think about what we can uh, be comfortable uh, supporting. Yeah, and for me, so, you know, the I, where I want to know, know more about the limits are, you know, what can these rooms, if we're keeping the six foot distance, which is in the MOA and is best practices by the CDC, um, at least as of tonight, if we're keeping six feet and we have to airflow or those are the limits that we can use to kind of figure out student numbers, then I want to know what those, what the limits are. Right. And, um, that'd be very helpful. Thank you, Mike. Yeah. All right. Tim Leonard. Uh, no, I have to agree with what Brad and Matt said. If we can get kids into the classroom, I I would be all for it. I want to see them in more. I'm not sure how we're going to do that. If we have the space in, I mean, the K through five, I know that Russell Street and Shaker Lane's classrooms are bigger and we can probably put a few more kids per classroom, but I'm not sure. Like Matt said, how do we decide who's going back? Is it as an and a curriculum based, are we doing it social emotional? Are we doing just a lottery? I mean, that'll be something we need to really look into. And then as far as like middle school and the high school, I know in the middle school that one of the cohorts, I think it's cohort B is a bit bigger. Like I know that like the algebra classes, the math classes are bigger and Jason can confirm this for me. Um, how do we get more kids in at that level, I mean, it probably would be that even if they were a cohort B, they'd have to be a cohort A. But there's going to be, at, I think, at the high school and middle school, there'll be a lot more maneuvering or more moving parts because of the switching of classrooms and the not staying in one classroom with one teacher. But I definitely want the administration to look into it and try to get these kids in to school. I think it would benefit a lot of them in a social capacity and a mental capacity and it, as well as the curriculum to for tops, but the social emotional needs that they have to get need to be in, you know, so yes, I would support it. Right. Michelle, hang on one second. Thank I know you, you had your hand up. I'm going to ask all the principals in Dr. Clenchy to chime in uh, pretty quickly here. Matt, do you want to? Well, I just wanted to add that you know, I, I specifically um, cited K to five as a priority. I think the administration wants to look into. Um, I also think an important group is the seniors. Um, you know, their time is running out. Um, they're going to be out of out of the schools at the end of May. If there's anything we can do to get those kids in more often, and as Tim Lynn said, I know there's a lot more moving parts at the high school, but um, you know. If we're, if we're going to look into this, uh, that's another group that I really want to see focused on. Mm -hmm. I agree. All right. Justin, you any thoughts? Yeah, sure. I've got a, um, a couple of talking points here. I'll try to put them in order so they make sense. Um, I am all for coming up with some new plans. Um, and I want to preface this by saying, I think we've done great work up until now. Um, and, and we, we put these hybrid, plans in place in the summertime thinking, I mean, you know, a couple of us joked about it. We were hoping to get to Columbus Day and then we were hoping to get to Halloween. And here we are in February and we're, we're with the same plans, but it's not like we haven't been doing anything. I mean, we've been trying to figure out how to return from holidays and attestation forms. Mike made the news with that stuff. <laughs> um, we had to renegotiate the LEA contract, mid, you know, in the middle, like during the school year. So I know all of a sudden it feels like it's this giant rush. Um, the time is now to start talking about this, but it's, we're not behind. I mean, I know some other districts starting to announce plans for full return K to five. Um, and that's why I think that it's very appropriate that it's on our agenda tonight. So my here, my, my thoughts would be to potentially sort of reverse engineer this thing. And I would love for the administration to come up with a plan for full um, five day in person return. Um, and, you know, that very well might not be possible this school year if we, you know, the, as Brad mentioned, six feet in the MOA. So it just, it just might not be possible, but I'd love for that plan to be out there. So it's something that we can work towards. Um, 
in that plan, we might have some things like, you know, testing positivity rate within our, within our school district. If you've got six weeks where there's zero positive pools, I don't think six feet matters as much anymore. Um, and then once we've got those plans in place, um, those are sort of the long-term goals. I'd love for the administration to share with us sort of a couple baby steps on how we can work towards that. And that's some of the things that I think have already been discussed, such as optimal usage of our space. Um, another way to say that would be max density at six feet. Max density at six feet uh, um, sounds a little scary. I think optimum usage of our space sounds better. But I think we have some classrooms where the cohorts might be a little lopsided. Um, we might have, and, and I believe that the in, original intent was 50% of the children in the classroom. I think we can get to 60%, maybe 70%, maybe even a little more and still be six feet of spacing, which doesn't change anything. We're going to mask, we're going to sanitize, we're going to um, be six feet apart. So I think that that should be a strategy that gets presented. And, it, and I'm not trying to put this on the administration, but I recognize you guys as the experts with the building space. And if you need help, I'm, sh you know, I'm sure we get tons of volunteers. Um, I apologize that I don't have a lot of information or insight on the middle school or the high school, just because I don't have, it's been a while since I've been in middle school or high school, and I don't have any kids in those uh, years. But I welcome folks to email us and talk about or brainstorm on how those programs, the programming's different. I don't certainly want to leave those guys out. And I also do support a full return or very close to a full return for seniors. So my priorities are K to five and, and the seniors. Um, additionally, I think it's important that we probably survey our families. So when we, when we were presented with a remote model, a hybrid model, and a um, full in-person model, we surveyed the families at that point in time because we knew what the plans were. So I think if we can come up with some plans, we probably need to survey the families to see what kind of traction we're going to get um, so that we know what the numbers are going to be like when we, when we look to implement something. Um, you know, if we're, if we're shooting for 75% attendance and only 75% of folks are interested in coming back that frequently, th that's a win-win all the way around. Um, additionally, I think it's really important that we probably start talking with the LEA again. I don't want to, um, put plans in place or, um, wait to the end or have to delay the process. So I think it would be appropriate to sort of ask our negotiation team to touch base with their negotiation team and say, Hey, this was on our agenda. These are some of the things we talked about. We'd love to get some dialogue going just to see how this might be possible. And then additionally, sort of my last question along Matt's point, and I did reach out to many, uh, it was like three political uh, offices about vaccination for teachers and trying to move them up the, the totem pole, is, Kelly, do you have any idea or does anyone have any insight as to when we hit phase two, group three, and teachers become eligible with every other essential worker, is there a plan in place for us to potentially bring uh, vaccination to the to the teachers so that we have sort of a max vaccination day and we're not asking the teachers to take a day off of work and figure out the scheduling and all that stuff. I know that we probably don't have answers to any of this stuff, but I'm, I'm looking for answers um, as it relates to these questions over the next couple of weeks uh, and weeks to come. So. Right now, uh, Justin, <clears throat> it's, it's uh, as uh, unpredictable as figuring out weather forecasts. Uh, we do have some feelers out there, and uh, I just can't disclose at this point in time. Uh, it wouldn't be fair to the people that I've been dealing with. But uh, again, the, the, this, these are health issues, not school issues. So we, we work with health agencies and anybody else that can help us, but, but they're controlling the strings here. And, and it, it obviously depends on, on how quickly they can produce vaccines. So you can be rest assured I'm having conversations and putting pressure in the right places. Uh, and we will do what we can to, to have an organized rollout of, of uh, vaccines. But I have to tell you, there, there are so many divergent processes going on right now. It, it, uh, 
it's to some degree out of our control, although we would like more control. I mean, CVS, uh, Walgreens, uh, VA components. Uh, I mean, those are all, all affecting who's getting vaccinated at this point in time. Now that there are, are regulations that are being followed. Uh, my understanding is, is people 65 and over with two comorbidities uh, will be starting to be vaccinated within the next two weeks. Right after that, they're, they're going to start focusing on, on uh, educators and, and, and public education staff, private education staff. So my, my hope is middle of March, uh, last week of March, we're going to see things rolling. But uh, I've been very explicit in my expectations in terms of if we're going to vaccinate, vaccinate staff, we need a plan. And, and we certainly don't want to mass vaccinate staff when we realize that, that uh, some people are, are going to be under the weather the next day. We don't want to have to shut our schools down because we're vaccinating staff all at once. So uh, these messages have been delivered loud and clear, and they will be continue to de be delivered until we, we get the uh, necessary cooperation to uh, move forward. Mm. Um, you all start, Justin? Um, yeah, yeah, that, that was, okay. for the most part, high-level stuff and potentially chime back in on some other things. Thanks. Right. Timlin? Yeah, just on Justin's, I know that he wants that plan for five, like five days full in. I just want to make it clear to people that are listening that we still have to offer remote for those people oh, that yeah. Yeah. that aren't coming. So I don't want people to like start emailing us like I'm not sending my child. We ha still have to offer a remote program for those parents and families that choose that for their families. Yeah. And I think Justin, I don't want to misrepresent what you said. I think what you're saying is that's an aspiration we may have to do it in stages to get there. Um, to, to get, uh, right. Maybe I act. Okay. Yep. No, you're, you're right. And Timlin, thank you for, I, you know, I skipped over that, but yeah. No, I, I just, I just wanted to make sure we weren't inundated with emails. No, like good, good job. I just want to make yeah, sure parents collecting the inbox. Thank you. Right. Um, and yes, Brad, you're correct. So it was, what's it take to get to five day? And then what are the baby steps to get there? And, you know, can we implement step one? March 1st um, and what's that going to look like? And then what's the step for April 1st and, and so on. Yeah. Um, it, it's conceivable that if you take out the, re the remote only learners that want to remain remote only and you survey the parents and find of the hybrid families and find out that some percentage of them are comfortable with two days and really don't, won't come back for more then you have a number and you might say, well, what does it take to fit that number in five days a week? It might be uh, four feet, 60, you know, three and a half inches and you're there. Right. I mean, like that, that's the exercise to go through. And then you might find out that if that's going well, now more people want to come in. It's like, oh, well, four feet doesn't work anymore to accommodate the next level of, of people that want to come back. We're down to two feet, seven inches. What does that mean? And that gets into the, can the Swiss cheese model tolerate that? Or, or do we get to a point where we're like, no, that's not going to work. So that's kind of what, what I'm envisioning as that, that, you know, from a reverse engineering perspective, that's the way I would see that going. And, and you're right, Brad, to a, a high degree, that is probably aspirational. But as we drive towards the end of the school year and transition towards the beginning of a new school year that may not be all the way back to normal yet, that's where we may be, right? Like we're, we're, we don't talk about six feet anymore, but we're still talking about something. We just, it's going to, we just got to figure out what that is. So this is going to be, uh, the, the next intervention level, and then we're going to do it again and again and again after that in all likelihood, because this isn't going to be over in all likelihood by September. It could be way, way, way better, but I don't think it's going to be over. Um, and I, I just want to chime in on my own uh, comments along the lines, and then um, we'll have a few more input from ourselves and then open it up to the administrators. I agree that right now the six feet, uh, unless I see something coming out of the advisory agencies, is kind of a, a significant line in the sand that's not going to move uh, for the moment anyway. Uh, it could change as we get towards a higher level of vaccination during this particular school year, and I'm optimistic that it would be uh, definitely something that moves uh, towards September. Um, I do think that we, we have the capacity to increase the number of kids 
and stay at six feet, especially at the K, uh, excuse me, the first through five level. Uh, remember, the, the, the kindergartners are already in four days a week, half day. Um, so I think we need to, in a, on a fairly immediate basis, is reevaluate our use of the space. And uh, Justin, I like the term you used is like, what is the optimal level? Really being uh, six feet is six feet is six feet. And this room can handle this many kids. Then let's see if we can get enough families that want to be here to get them in more of these kids in four or five days a week. Um, and I think that is, is a doable in relatively short order. When we talk about, do we want, do we want to redo the cohort model and, and really make a big change that is going to change scheduling and everything else that might be harder to do in the short term. Doesn't mean we shouldn't try and it doesn't mean we shouldn't plan. It's just a question of how do we want to allocate our limited resources so that we see some benefit in the short term more benefit in the near term and a lot of benefit in the longer term. That's, that's the rub. That's, you know, we, we don't have unlimited resources. We don't have unlimited amount of time in a day or a week. Uh, I know Brad, you talked about reconvening possibly task forces. I don't disagree with that, that that's a good idea. I don't know if it, I know it's less feasible now than it was during the summer when people had time because school wasn't in session. Uh, I tend to think that at this point, that might not be as doable and it, we may have to just rely on the administration to get this done, uh, you know, by themselves and then solicit that community input a little bit more after the fact, but before we actually act. Um, but they, um, but that's just my personal thought about that. I agree with Matt and, and Tim, like how do we figure out uh who to, who to bring back? What's the the most equitable equitable way to do that? Um, and I, I'm very curious to see what the administration has to think about that. But I also think that if we survey the families, we may find out that that's not going to be as pressing as we thought. That there may be families that are even hybrid families that are are fine the way it is and aren't really looking for more. Um, I do agree that that grades one through five for me are the primary focus for the next few weeks uh, uh, because I think that if we can get uh, up into that 60, 70 high percentage that Justin was talking about, I think that's the, the uh, group that would benefit the most uh, and, and avoid the, the most negative impact um, if, by keeping them out. If we can get them in, I think better. I agree with Matt that the seniors is, is a special group that we need to think about. I'm curious to see what Dr. Harrington thinks about that. Um, and I do believe that, you know, we should be asking for parallel efforts. So while we might focus on first through fifth grade in these next two, three, four weeks, I would expect Dr. Harrington and Jason Everhart to still be working on coming up with some ideas to put in front of us um, for their own buildings. Um, at this point, I would like to ask Dr. Clenchy what he thinks and then get some input from the principals. And then uh, based if, if we have as school committee members, some responses to that, great. And then we will definitely open it up for public input. So Dr. Clenchy. Thanks, Mike. Uh, I'm glad we're having this discussion. Uh, it, it's, it's time to, to start talking about what we can do to phase in. I'm gonna, I'm gonna emphasize the word phase in different models as we, we analyze data and, and things are, are changing. Uh, with our pool of testing, we're, we're getting very valuable data to, to capture uh, asymptomatic individuals, uh, may also capture individuals that uh, already had COVID-19 and didn't know they had it, which is, is just interesting to know. Uh, we have been working uh, together with our, our uh, grades one to five staff, and uh, we, we are un unraveling a, a first phase of the plan so to speak, and, and our, our chair knows about it, and so does Justin to, to a certain degree because we were consulting with them throughout the process. When we first started talking about four-day in-person learners, we talked about the needs of our students, not only academic needs, but social and emotional needs. So we have uh, taken a look at our, our classrooms in, in grades one to five, looked at any ways we could rearrange them to fit more students in the classrooms, 
looked at balancing the cohorts uh, as uh, I mean, some of you uh, on the school committee must realize with, with children in the school that our cohorts are not balanced uh, all the time in cohort A and B. <clears throat> so we've done that. Uh, when we come back from the break, uh, our administrators and teachers in grades K to five will be contacting parents on the basis of needs, both social, emotional, and academic, and identifying students uh, that we can bring into those classes to, to balance the cohorts out better than we have and also maintain six feet of distancing. Uh, we're hoping to roll this out as of March 1st. And, and then at that time, we can continue to de deliberate what the next phase will be. And the next phase, folks, is gonna be dependent on the data that we have. If our teachers are vaccinated, that's gonna give us greater confidence. If CDC changes their guidelines and, and uh, rids itself of six feet distance with scientific evidence, that will give us far more flexibility. Uh, even if we went to less than, than six feet of distancing, it can be problematic because as soon as we have a COVID case, uh, we are going to be quarantining a significant number of students because the, the litmus test for contact tracing is six feet or less for 15 minutes or more. That needs to be taken into account as we, we uh, figure out what, what phase two, and I'm gonna call it phase two is going to be. Uh, each classroom is unique unto itself. We have a different number of, of uh, staff members in each classroom and they take up space as well. So we're not gonna have, have equal, we, we will have equitable. But I think as a school committee, you need to understand that. Some of our classrooms may have three to four adults in them. And, and that will hamper the number of students that we can fit in those classrooms. But we, we're, we're optimistic. I already have some, some numbers from uh, Russell Street School today when I was uh, working with uh, Principal Temple. And uh, we're, you know, we're, gonna, we're gonna increase those numbers. Uh, I, I don't wanna use the word significantly, but noticeably by March 1st. Uh, a lot of you were mentioned about, mentioning about bringing back students full in person. Well, I, I have to make a comment, folks. That's our specialty. That's what we do year by year by year. So it's not the case of having a plan to come back five days a week. It's a case of identifying mitigation strategies that are gonna keep our students and staff safe. And in order to bring all students back, you're gonna be looking at social distancing spaces of less three or less feet. And, and if, if we have the data support to support it, CDC guidelines that support it, I mean, this, this can happen uh, when those things start to, to evolve. Uh, cold testing, I, I really believe, was, was a good next step in, in figuring out where we stand as a district in terms of infection rates. Uh, the vaccination of teachers is paramount in order for us to, to continue to move into different phases as we move forward. I also have a comment to make about getting people together again, like we did this summer. That was a great process, but most of that time was spent identifying instructional strategies and honing pedagogical skills that allowed us to prepare ourselves for the opening of school. The actual structure of, of, of bringing kids back is, is doesn't warrant sitting down with 50 people at once, it, it warrants having conversations with staffs and, and, and having input from our staffs and, and also at some point in time, input from our parents as we move forward. So we truly know whether, uh, maybe not whether, but how many parents are interested in having their students uh, go four days a week at this point in time. And then we need to start thinking about next fall, a little premature at this point in time, but if, 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 if the planets align, so to speak, hopefully we should be in pretty good shape to, to have a full in-person return. But everything has to, has to fall into place. Uh, it, it, would, it would be nice if, if we could always live in a black and white world, but we don't. We live in a gray world. And, and our decisions in order to keep staff safe, maximize educational opportunity, opportunities depends on the data that we have in front of us. That's the only way we can design uh, implementation strategies for more in-person learning that is going to continue to keep our students and staff safe. 
Uh, if you have any questions, I, I'd be more than happy to answer them before you go on to, to uh, the school principals. Justin? Yeah, thanks, Dr. Clenchy. Um, I, my comment about returning five days a week, um, I hope that there was no, no offense taken. My, my point was that we are, the world is a different place, and I don't think the coronavirus is going anywhere anytime soon. So if we were to ultimately achieve five days a week full in person for those that wanted to opt into it, reserving the right for remote, um, what does that look like? How do we do lunches? Um, are we, to Mike's point, are we five feet three inches apart? Are we four feet two inches apart? Because we're going to need to know what that is because we're going to need to talk to the LEA because we're going to need to renegotiate that. So, yeah. uh, you know, how do you, how do you, how do you move people through the hallway? Um, so it's just, you know, it, it, it possibly isn't premature to be thinking about this for the fall because um, it, this rest of the school year is going to get busy and then it's the summertime and then geez, all of a sudden we're back in school again. Um, so, you know, I, I'm excited and thrilled that um, you guys are already thinking about some of this stuff and that we all seem to be one giant team. I love that. Um, and I'm looking forward to hearing from the rest of the uh, leadership team. Thanks, Justin. Let's uh, go ahead and we'll start with uh, Shaker Lane and, and work our way up in ascending uh, age from there. Shell, what are your, what are your thoughts and based on what you've heard and experienced? Uh, I am so excited about this. It's no secret that I've been wanting to do this since I've seen some of our little ones uh, falling apart as early as Thanksgiving. So I am very excited about this. Um, I echo everything that Dr. Clenchy said. I think he stole a lot of my thunder. Thank you, Dr. Clenchy. <laughs> but I love the idea of the staff and myself and Ms. Deacon and Ms. Mather and our school counselor collaborating on this high need students right now, the next layer of students coming back before we start to survey everyone, because I think if we start surveying everyone, we may not have the room at this time. So these teachers know these kids, these teachers know which kids are struggling on those hybrid remote days. They should be driving this bus right now. And so the conversations that I know I've had with the staff over the past week, you know, they can pick out those kids and there is an imbalance of cohorts. So cohort A might have 12 kids where cohort B has seven. So we're bringing those numbers up. Um, we have a, a healthy number that we're going to be bringing back, um, hopefully March 1st, and then looking forward to the next phase. Um, I think that this is definitely not a rush. This is something that's been on all of our minds. Um, I've had handfuls and handfuls of parents reach out. I've had meetings with parents trying to push back the tides, but I think it's washed over and it's about time to bring them back as, as safely as we can, keeping the five feet of distance. We can accommodate it in the lunchroom um, because our kindergarten classrooms are, I think the biggest one is either 16 or 17. Um, we can accommodate those numbers in the first and second grade classrooms now because we have two sets of 16, 17 on each side. Um, Keeping that Wednesday as that solid remote day, I think is key. That's one day where you can build class and community. Everybody's together. I know it's remote, but it is one day where everybody is together. They're all doing the same thing. So that is something I would like for us to preserve. Um, so huge proponent of this. Very excited. We're ready to go March 1st. You want me to go next? Yes, go ahead, Cheryl. Oh, I didn't know if we were waiting on questions for Michelle. Um, everything Michelle said. Talk about stealing thunder, Michelle. Um, we've been looking at this for the last couple of weeks at Russell Street. Um, um, it's uh, Our plan is similar to what Justin said earlier. We really looked at, um, at where our numbers are in each classroom to balance out our cohorts. So if we have a cohort um, of 14 in a classroom and the, the – um, opposite cohort only has 11, we're looking to increase that classroom by three. So the Monday, Tuesday, and the Thursday, Friday would both have 14. Um, if we have classes in certain grades that have um, fewer kids and we can increase, um, we're doing that. So I currently have in front of me a list um, of 35 um, names of um, 
of students that um, teachers would like to come back across three grade levels. That's increasing our capacity by about 12%. Um, so we'd be from 50 up to 62. Um, I completely agree with Michelle 100% about the maintaining the Wednesday. I think that's of utmost importance um, right now in our first um, baby step, as Justin said. Um, you know, I think this is a really good way to have more kids come back totally based on um, need as determined by the teachers. We have multiple data points that teachers can reference. Um, I had said to Dr. Clenchy about a week ago, if I go to my staff and say, give me a list of kids, they can uh, right off the top of their heads, tell me which kids they, they really wish they could have back in their classroom because it will be that much of a benefit for them. Um, and, the, and all of the lists um, came right in when I talked to staff about that. So um, I too, just um, the next step in my process is to just make some phone calls, um, but I am prepared to invite 35 students um, to start um, in at the Russell Street School four days a week um, for March 1st. Brad? I'm, I really appreciate your enthusiasm for this and the work you've been doing. Um, I, I know knew some work was going on. I didn't know at, at this level down to, to student names, but make sure I understand this if you don't mind. So you have a list of 30, 35 students that your teachers want to invite back in. Um, does that mean those students would then be going four days a week? Is that, okay. Yep. And the same thing for you, um, Ms. King? Okay. I imagine you're going to get a lot of emails from parents tonight, um, hoping their kids are on the list and there will be parents who who know their kids are struggling, who sees their kids struggling, but maybe sees it in ways that teachers don't. Mm -hmm. um, just, I, I don't know how to resolve that. I just, if this is, if this is what we're talking about doing two weeks when we return, um, just know there's gonna be um, you're going to have a lot of emails, a lot of calls. Yeah, I, I do. And I, and we're certainly anticipating that. I do think it has to be a phased in approach. Um, like Justin and, and Dr. Clenchy said a few minutes ago, um, you know, this would be our first step. And these are the kids, as Michelle mentioned, with um, the most amount of need as determined by the teachers. Um, you know, they, you know, there's not a day that has passed that I haven't seen a teacher in the hallway that said, Oh, I wish I could have this student. This student really struggles with this. This student does super well two days a week in front of me and really falls apart. Um, and so those are the students based on need um, that were back based on academic need that we're having um, on our first list. Um, and I certainly envision once we have those 35 kids, if we get all 35 um, settled in, most of the teachers gave me the names and then a few more. Yeah. So we could, um, once we have those students um, settled in, could certainly after several weeks, um, go, you know, see how that settles in and then go back and see if we can increase capacity in classrooms. At this point, we're maintaining the six feet. We're not increasing um, desk capacity, the desks are there, we're increasing in person face to face for students to even out the cohort. So that's where the 35 in our first step comes from. Great. Thank you, Brad. I'm glad you brought that up. Uh, this is just the first phase. And, and, and the second phase, uh, you know, obviously would would be in would be more in line with with uh, taking a look at the cohorts that we have and, and restructuring them. So we would offer more time for, for all students. So I wanna be clear to everybody that this isn't the final phase. This is just a, a phase to get things going. You know, it, there's a delicate balance between deliberation and action. And, and we felt as a leadership team, uh, it, it was right for us to sit down and, and, and hold true to our, our beliefs in terms of how we, we created uh, opportunities for, for some of our students to start the year with, with four days of in-person learning. So it was really an extension of that. And then it gives us time as a, as a school committee and, and administrative team and, and community to take a look at what, what does phase two look like when, when our mitigation strategies uh, continue to evolve. We have vaccines, for example, or our pool testing data helps us. So we, we, we see this as, as just one phase and, and, and perhaps multiple phases as we're moving forward here. Well, I'll, I'll get out of the way in a second, Mike, but I really appreciate that we have something, it seems like a plan kind of ready to go as quickly as possible and that it's based on teachers um, and their, their beliefs. If, if we're aiming for this for March 1, as we move to middle school and high school, um, you know, I'd like 
the, it's been next month coming up a plan. So we have something and a deadline for, um, for us to implement to increase capacity there as well. Maybe not March 1st, but March 15th or something like that. I think that's, an, from my perspective, that's a, a ne- one of our next conversations to have. And, and, and one thing that we probably haven't talked about very much is the, the middle school and high school have been making changes uh, throughout the year with, with parent requests when they can. And, and I agree, now we, we need to get to that, that next phase as well. And, and uh, it was Timelin who mentioned the seniors and, and that definitely needs to be an area of focus. But uh, I agree, we need to take a look at what we're doing in six to 12 and, and see what we can do to uh, increase uh, in-person learning opportunities. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Jason, do you, do you have any thoughts about? Yeah, I, I can just speak to the, to the middle school experience. Um, you know, we don't have the same flexibility that, that maybe we see it at, at Shaker and Russell. And it's due largely because of course selection. Um, sixth grade, the students all take the same classes for the most part outside of unified arts. So there is some wiggle room there. Um, we had quite a few families who chose to be remote to begin the year. So if, if sixth grade families wanted to return, we have some space for that to happen. Seventh and eighth grade, we are, we're, we're, we're not as, as open. Eighth grade is by all intents and purposes, pretty much closed. Um, our very high algebra numbers in eighth grade math, um, world language choices really dictate how the other classes um, fill out. So you might have a social studies class or an ELA class that's fairly low one section, but it's because another section is, is over full. So it becomes a game of whack-a-mole, right? We can move certain kids around, but it's only going to cause something else to be, to be out of sorts somewhere else. And so we've really struggled um, with eighth grade being able to, to do that. We've had parents who wanted to put kids into uh, algebra classes, and we just haven't had the numbers to be able to support it because it, it throws off the schedule. Seventh grade is approaching that um, because of pre-algebra and general math. Their, their, their numbers are, are, are going to be there soon as more of those families request to come back. You know, the same holds true in our unified arts classes. While the unified arts classes are all the same, they're not. So for example, our music program, our seventh grade general music is already over full, and that's the only time that it's offered. So if kids wanted to take band, right, or something else, it creates that, it creates that problem. So we have some wiggle room in sixth, um, a little bit less in seventh. Eighth is, eighth is going to be really tough to accommodate. So I think moving forward, you know, the worry I have with trying to fit more desks in, I walked around some of the sixth grade classes today just to see, could we squeeze more desks in? And, and the only way to really do that would be to push the kids against the walls, right? And then you're blocking a lane to the fire doors that go from room to room. I have concerns about that because I just, I just don't want us to be breaking code just to get two or three more kids in, in per room. So that's kind of where we're at. It doesn't mean we can't sit down and take a hard look. With the, with the families that came back in January, what we started to do was really look at moving people away from the idea of A and B based on last name and really where the space is. So moving forward, we're certainly, we're already in the process of doing that and we'll continue to do that, um, you know, as long as it doesn't, it doesn't cause problems with transportation or with, with families with kids in multiple grades. So while we have some, some, some wiggle room, um, blowing up the schedule and, and redoing it all would be yeoman's work to try and get done in, in a February or an April break. And so I think that the best course of action for the middle school at this point is to fill in where we can and then see you know, what we can do along the way to, to tweak it and then really plan for September. I, I agree with what a number of the school committee said. If we, if we knew in August that we would be still in, in school in February and March, you know, this thing may have looked a little bit different. We might have planned it differently. But given where we're at now, I don't know if that there's a way for us to really overhaul the middle school program in the short, short time that we have without completely upending student schedules, transportation days, cohorts. I think it, it could create more problems than it solves. All right. Dr. Harrington? Yeah, uh, thank you for this time. Uh, appreciate the opportunity to provide some input. Uh, just so folks know, similar to some of the other schools, I know the younger grades have been talking to my colleagues from um, at various meetings, and um, we are looking to increase the number of four-day students. Uh, in fact, we identified at least 10, day, uh, 10 uh, students who would like to recommend for that. Uh, so that process is already underway. We have about 37% of our students remote. 
we have seen just in regards to seniors, we have seen an uptick or increase as the year has gone along from the number of student seniors who started remote and, uh, and now have transit, um, who started hybrid rather, and then have transitioned to remote. Um, so that's something to be aware of. There's a wide variety of reasons why seniors might um, want to be remote at this time. They've gotten to colleges, they're, um, it's the weather, they have more freedom. Uh, we've, we've talked to them about that. So I'd like to have some conversations with the senior class, the class officers and their teachers to encourage them on how we would integrate more seniors, especially as they close out the year to give them a more sense of community and connection to the school. Um, so happy to explore that um, further. We also just a side note for the community at large, we have had extensive discussions about seniors at the PTA with the staff, with the school leadership team, with the class officers and the class advisor, but um, offering various senior activities um, in March, April, and uh, May, and obviously we'll finish in June, on June 4th. So stay tuned for updates about that. Just wanted to get that little announcement out there. In regards to the uh, cohort size, we'd have to examine what, what we could do there. We do have a little bit of a lopsided balance there. We have 15 more in cohort B uh, than cohort A. I think there is, there. Uh, Keith and I, uh, Keith Camo, the assistant principal, and I have been discussing uh, we the space in the in some of the classrooms. Like Jason pointed out, it would depend on the schedule because of the various classes. One class might be particularly large in one mod, and then they go into a next mod, and there's two kids in the room. Uh, so we'd need to see how we could balance that out. I do feel that there's room at the high school to increase our capacity of in-person learning. Uh, we want to get going on this. We're happy to be at this place. We wanted to be at this place. We expected it. Uh, as everyone has pointed out, this was a phase we expected to go through and eventually getting as soon as possible to uh, in-person learning, it, you know, be bearing in mind all the, the safety and health protocols and precautions. Um, but as the other principals have pointed out, uh, or just to add or emphasize, we really want to identify high needs and struggling students at all grade levels uh, and really prioritize whether it's a academic issue or a social emotional issue or mental health issue really kids some of our kids are really struggling at home with feeling disconnected and, and emotionally and we want to provide that opportunity for some social aspect and feel connected on a regular basis so that's going to be our priority as we sort of look at all grade levels and identify students who we should prioritize for in-person learning and make those recommendations just as the uh, pr principals at, at, at the younger schools have done, already pointed out um, but we want to get on this. We're excited to do it. And we think we can increase our capacity of in-person learning. Um, and we're going to try to reach out to people first, uh, rather than do a survey and have lots of disappointed people who we couldn't accommodate. Um, so I hope that helps. Yeah, appreciate that. Any comments from school committee members after hearing from, yep, go ahead, Timlin. I just have one question for Jason and, and John. Um, Michelle and um, Cheryl had mentioned that they still really want the Wednesday remote day that the, that the staff, do you feel that the Wednesday remote day still needs to be remote or do you feel we could get the kids back in at, at the middle school and the high school on that opposite Wednesday to add days? I think we could, Tim, we have discussed this with the faculty. The feedback is pretty resounding from the faculty that the Wednesday is very beneficial um, and, um, you know, for all kinds of reasons, they're able to see all the kids at once uh, in terms of ease of or fluidity of instruction, smoothness of the instruction. Um, at some point, though, we, we have, like I pointed out before in my previous comments, that is a phase we would like to get to where we, we start to look at how do we do, you know, some schools might have a plan to do three days, you know, one cohort goes three days that week and the following week. I think we may have actually discussed right. Well, that's what I'm saying is if we can't get more kids into the classroom, can we give them more days by adding that Wednesday at the high school and middle school where cohort B, A yeah. goes one week and cohort B goes we, the other we, week? We know that day is coming. We know it will be subject to, you know, negotiations with the MO, with the association right. and MOA, but that is something we, we want to get to that point where we can be five days. I think it will come at a later phase though. Right. Um, that's what right. I'm pointing out now. I think we can make some really uh, targeted adjustments to various cohort sizes, uh, classrooms, and really prioritizing high need students, as well as just students who just maybe aren't, aren't flourishing at all, far from flourishing in the remote model. We do have, as you pointed out, and I appreciate you saying that there are a lot of people who prefer remote right now. Some kids are 
flying high on the remote model doing fine. Yeah, I mean, I had a daughter, my, my senior moved from hybrid to remote. So yes, some of the some of the seniors in particular, I've, I've yeah. had conversations with them. But there's other students as well, prefer it, particularly the winter weather, uh, the freedom that they have, uh, and they're not subject to all the safety protocols of being in person at the high school. So um, we have seen that and we, are, we see seniors asking for more senior privileges too, so they can leave the building uh, when they have a study. So just we would be mindful of that. So I hear you on the Wednesdays. I think it comes at a later phase. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I'd, like, I'd like to follow up with that. I, I, I agree with John. I, we, I, think, I don't think there's anybody on our staff that recognizes that we're going to have remote Wednesdays now through June. I think everybody knows that that's going away at some point. Um, and I and I guess I would say that, you know, where Cheryl and, and Michelle are saying that it, it levels the playing field for one day a week where everybody's in the same model. My concern is that if that was a one off and that was our only thing that we did to get more kids back in, I'm not sure that the benefit that the two days a month that each kid would have in school would outweigh the the the, the increased instruction that they would get from keeping Wednesdays where they are. So bringing kids back on Wednesdays, I think would work well in conjunction with something else, but standalone, I'm not sure that we'd see the benefit at the middle school level based on that. If it was the same kids coming in every Wednesday, that might be a different argument. But if we're talking about an AB alternating situation, you're talking really two days a month. I, I, I think, I think what we are able to provide students on Wednesdays is, 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 is far more valuable as it currently sits. So I'd look, I'd look to do it, you know, in, in conjunction with something else, but like John said, I think for right now, I'd like to be more mindful and thoughtful about what that might look like as we, as we proceed. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. When, when thinking about this, Tim, I'm not convinced that if we, we move into a phase two, that the current two cohort model is, is the way to go. I think there are other things we can do to restructure that, that would be far better. And, and I think we just need to keep putting our heads together. We do have some ideas, and, and uh, but there, there's gonna come a point in time where we really need to look at a, a different cohort structure to increase in-person learning. Okay, thank you. Any other questions and comments, Justin? Yeah, just had a, a, a quick one. Um, appreciate everyone's feedback. My primary concern is just, sorry, that's my dog. Uh, out of caution is we're, in, we're inviting 35 people back, which is terrific because we're recognizing that those folks are the ones that are gonna succeed the best in person. But my, my primary concern is what happens to number 36. You know, those parents feel like number 36 is just important as 35 parents, you know, feel about that student. And what we're doing then is we're putting 35 kids, 35 more kids in four days a week and it, everyone else is still two days a week. And that has its benefits. But what we're not doing is raising the bar and saying, okay, everyone gets at least three days. And I just want to bring that as Brad did. I just want to make that, known that I see that as a potential uh, problem. And I also wanna recognize the fact that this is just the first step. So um, knowing that other steps are likely to come, I think this is certainly something that maybe the community could have some patience with as we tiptoe our way back into this. Um, but another caution I'll have is that I think Wednesdays become all that more critical for in-person days if, we, um, if we're sticking with sort of the current cohort model because that could essentially raise the minimum bar to three days a week. Um, and maybe you could even get some kids in five days a week if you brought Wednesdays back. So it's like a staggered, you've got your students that need the most five and then a subset of four, and then at least everybody gets to go three. Um, so I'll, I'll stop talking, but that's, that's what I'm thinking as we uh, go through this exercise. Matt. Yeah, um, I, I would agree with Justin in, in that regard. I'd, I'd be curious to see whether it would be more beneficial to have 70 kids going in three days a week than uh, you know, 35 more kids going in four days a week. Um, that's, that's one thing that I'd just like to, to possibly look at because I think even adding one additional day for a lot of, these, for a lot of students is, is going to be uh, beneficial in the long run. Um, and then that way we're serving – more families and more, more students. We may find that, like I said, that some, when we survey people that that, that might be enough. Um, 
I don't know. But I just like to think outside of the box and see what we can come up with. I'm going to echo that. I, I appreciate the the fact that we're going to make some progress in in the in the in the short term here, and and not a a insignificant amount of prog progress. And I appreciate the fact that there's a date on it. I'm a little concerned that we're being too nebulous about these phases and and what and when is coming next. And I think the when, the what I can kind of live with that that needs still needs to be determined as we you, we work through a process. The when is, is something that I, I'm going to push back on. I would like to to have at that first through fifth grade level by the next you know school committee meeting, which I think we have a little bit of a longer break than normal, right? Um, because of the, of the maybe we don't, but we'll figure it out. But I would like a hard data analysis of the capacity of each classroom, and you get with six feet. And, you know, I know, Dr. Clinch, you mentioned, you know, there's staffing issues, and I, I know the rooms aren't used in blocks of desks. And there's, you know, breakout areas and things like that. So, but I, I really want a, in a short, you know, reasonably short order, a look at what the capacity is, and then we can reevaluate the new breakdown of Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, and four day, because that's, that's shifting, and see what room is left over that we can start to think about, you know, are there a few more kids that we can get in four days or is it time to start thinking about rejiggering the cohort model so that as Matt indicated that there's an opportunity to get more kids in even three days a week um, while not adversely affecting those high needs four day a week kids. But now we've really, uh, given some benefit to the whole population um, that, that wants it, right? And again, a survey at that point may be meaningful because the numbers coming back from the survey may show us a way to get there that we're not envisioning at the moment. And But, but again, my more important point that I'm trying to make is when can we finish an evaluation like that so that we can take a look at it at, at this type of forum. That could, I'm not putting you on the spot. Doesn't that, I'm not asking you necessarily to, to commit to it right now in this next few minutes, but that's what I'm asking for in general for that next effort is that we, we as a school committee get a date on when that can be done so that we can let the community know that that's when it's going to be uh, presented and considered. So just for clarity, Mike, I, I think I understand what you're saying. You're, you're, you're really asking us what, what is the maximum capacity of each classroom with six feet of distance. We already have a lot of that information. We just have to, to tailor it to, to the number of staff in the room. So that shouldn't be that difficult to, to do. I don't want to speak for the principals too much here, but I, I think that's doable at the next meeting. And, and uh, I don't want to commit to that until I have a private conversation with them. But I appreciate uh, that. That's fair. We can certainly take a look at that. And just, just something to think about. We, you know, we're kind of talking about phase one, but you know, Mike and I have had some conversations and, and what, what I meant by changing the cohort models. Uh, I mean, uh, one way of, of, of considering how to, how to even talk about phase two and maybe something we can do, or maybe there's other models that we haven't thought of. If, if we took our, our in-person students and divided them into five cohorts, and at that point in time had Wednesdays as, a, as an in-person day, it would mean on any given day, 20% uh, of our, our, our students uh, once a week would be remote. So on, on Monday, for example, you would have 20% out. Tuesday, you would have another a different group out right through Monday, Friday. That would, that would increase uh, in-person learning to four days a week. The, the challenge with that model is it would be very difficult to, well, I'm not going to say it would be, it couldn't be done in, in some classrooms maintaining six feet of distance. In some of our classrooms, it could, but others, it couldn't. So just right. some, some food for yep. thought. I appreciate it. Yeah, I think you got the direction that I'm asking for, and, and 
I'm certainly willing to give you guys time to think about what, how, how quickly you can get that done. And as soon as we, you, you know, let us know and we'll incorporate it into an agenda. Mike, can I say one thing and then, then I'll, I'll yep. start again. Is I, I like this idea of let's triage, let's get the students who are most need the help in as quickly as possible. Then let's do a real capacity assessment um, and, and figure out how we can maximize that. But we keep, I mean, we, we're still throwing around six feet. It, that's, that's contractual. We negotiated that. We signed off on that. Any, um, I don't want to be speculating about, hey, we can go down to four feet or five feet without saying that we're going to have to talk about that with our partners and, and just, just want to throw that out there. Right now, it's not just our preference. It's what we've agreed to and what we've committed to. And um, everybody needs to know that. Um, and that, that's something we signed up for and something the LEA signed up for. And um, we have to honor it. Yep. You're, you're exactly right about that. All right. All right. Let's uh, open up for public input. Jen Gold, please state your name, your street, and your question, please. Hey, this is Jen Gold, 259 Harwood Ave. Thank you for calling on me again. Um, okay, you guys have given us a ton of information. I really appreciate it. Um, I had certain questions going in that I now had to reformulate uh, into, into statements or maybe change the questions, so I appreciate all that. I guess I want to kind of categorize my thoughts into three areas. Number one, while I totally appreciate the work that you guys do, full respect and thank you for, for all the time that you all put into everything. I do have to say that I am a little bit disappointed, more than a little bit, um, that it's taken this long to come up with a plan. And I'm glad you actually put forth an actual plan with these 35 kids idea um, tonight. That's progress, like that's an actual tangible plan. Um, and I think it makes sense. I think that's, it's a great start. Um, but I do think that, you know, I've heard a lot of talk tonight from, from some of you about, this is a good time to start looking at the data and thinking about how to move forward. And I just ha start thinking and planning like that should have started many, many months ago. I get it. This is a nebulous situation. Things are changing. Goalposts are moving. But, you know, come up with a goal and try to make a plan that has contingencies, that has variable milestones and like variable sub plans within it based on certain milestones. Right. So I'm glad that we've heard something tonight. And I've also heard um, that, you know, this getting the 35 whatever kids back is just a start and there'll be hopefully a fast follow for a plan after that. I'd love, like like Mike, you said, at the next meeting to hear what the plan is for after that. And maybe it's, ba hopefully it's based on some of the pool testing data, that would be fantastic. But as you guys know, you're gonna get emails after tonight saying, what about my kid? What if my kid doesn't make it into the 35? Like my kid really needs to be back too. And so, you know, you're gonna get those emails. And I think it just behooves all of us to come up with a plan again, even if it has, uh, you know, d variable um, path paths <laughs> based on certain milestones. So, so thank you. And I, I would use um, the plans we heard from the from um, the athletic director as an, an example. That was phenomenal. I was really impressed by his presentation, and I think that was super thought out, super well researched. He talked to all the right agencies and groups, and I just, you know, you guys are awesome. But I, I really love to see a little bit more of that proactive planning and details. So thank you. Um, secondly, the idea to me that Wednesdays are off the table because the teachers really love having that day to not have to teach the kids in person. They are teaching, I know that, but to have the full remote, um, it, it just really rankles me. Um, the, uh, the thought that two extra days a month doesn't offset, you know, the benefit of that doesn't offset the negative impact. Well, <laughs> If my kid is, is my kid happens, my kids happen to be in cohort A, and this month they're, if we're lucky, we'll get three days in person this month. So two extra in person days on top of three is a huge difference within a month's time. So, you know, maybe this month is unusual. I hope, knock on wood, but two extra days a month, even in a regular month, if they normally have eight days, best of circumstances, and they get two extra, that's a huge, huge percentage on top of the eight. So, I really would urge you guys to reconsider or, or consider pushing back on that, figuring out ways that we could use those Wednesdays for in-person learning. And then finally, um, I just wanted to say, like, it sounds like we're basing the, te like, I, I'm, I'm curious about the teacher's asks, right? It sounds like you guys keep referring to the MOA. And if I'm 
correct. I mean, I, I may be wrong, but I think the MOA was developed either in the summer or early fall. Has that been revisited at all? I mean, it's been many, many months since then. There's been a ton of, of data, research. We've been pool testing, vaccinations. Are we still trying to meet the teachers where they are within the, you know, within the confines of the LOA? Or are we going to talk to them about potentially shifting their goalposts and compromising? I know it's all that negotiation, but um, I am a little surprised to hear that we're still talking about the MOA, which is basically outdated at this point. And curious to know, like, what the communication plan is with the teachers. I feel like there should be constant communication with the teachers in order to try to, we know there's going to be negotiation and that's going to take a long time. So why not start that sooner than later and get the ball rolling on helping them shift so that we can all be aligned in what we want, getting the kids back. Um, I think that's it. Thank you. All right. So uh, appreciate your comments. Um, uh I'm going to respond directly to the last consideration about the MOA. It's important to remember that the MOA isn't the be all and end all of our communication with the LEA and the staff in terms of how we, uh, you know, can make changes and, and conduct uh, the school days. Uh, anything that, that we want to do that's already covered in the MOA, for instance, if we want to add students to classrooms and we're still meeting the MOA requirements, we don't have to negotiate that. We would just, you know, work with the teachers and make sure they understand that's happening because that's, you know, that that's important. But that outside, you know, negotiation out that might warrant and, and do warrant at some point revisiting what we're doing that would impact the MOA. Like Brad has mentioned, like right now the six feet is in the MOA. So to go outside inside the six feet, we would have to negotiate that. At this point, the things, the vaccine rollout, the testing is so preliminary that it has had no impact on our understanding of what we think is the right effort of mitigation. We think that that's coming in, in you know, hopefully in the near future, but it, it hasn't, those benefits haven't been realized at all. Uh, it's just too preliminary for, for, you know, we've tested for one week. We haven't had our teachers vaccinated yet. Um, so in respect to the MOA, we definitely will revisit it when we think the opportunity is right. We think we're getting very, you know, closer than we've been. Uh, the other thing to keep in mind is our numbers, community numbers and in the schools spiked significantly from where they were. So any thought that we had an opportunity after what we saw in September and October, where we might say, oh, you know, maybe we did overestimate the mitigation required. Let's take a look at the MOA and see if we can, you know, revisit it to, to get some relief here, went out the window as soon as the, those health metrics spiked up. Um, there was no real assumption on our part that that, that that was a viable thing to bring to the LEA. Um, so, you know, that's going to change. I think we are definitely going to have some discussions uh, with them uh, before the year is out, well before the year is out, to think about what the current year means in terms of the MOA and, and bargaining with them. And then I fully expect that this MOA is going to be moot, and a, a but it will probably require another MOA for at least the beginning of the school year next year, because I don't I think it's safe to say that we're not going to be back to uh, September of 2019. I know we're not going to be, well, I'm, I don't know. I'm, I'm very optimistic we won't be back to September 2020, but it's not going to be September 2019 either. It's going to be September 2021. We'll have to see where we're at and what that means for, for uh, our relationship with the, with the union and the teachers and our staff and our community and, and the students and families. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Dan. Alana Clements, please state your name, your street, and your question, please. Hi, Alana Clements, um, 20 More Lane. Oh, <laughs> pineapple just came up. Um, <laughs> <laughs> clearly, my son was using my computer earlier today. <laughs> um, oh, sure, sure, Alana, sure, it was your son. Sure, <laughs> okay. Alana, um, so I have t two things to say. One, um, I just want everyone to know that my kids did the testing this week and they said it was really easy and it didn't hurt at all. So I know a lot of people were afraid that it would hurt because we've heard stories about it, like feeling like they're scraping your brain, but um, it, it, they said it didn't hurt and they were really happy. So um, that went really well. Um, also, I wanted to say I'm worried about if you take away the six feet, that's one of the layers of cheese. 
is the six feet the reason why our numbers have been so good like we're so lucky that because i thought we wouldn't make it till columbus day i thought for sure we'd be fully remote and we're not i think because <clears throat> of what we've put in place and it's really working because the only time we went fully remote was by choice as a precaution it wasn't because we had to because there was an outbreak I have friends in other districts whose kids haven't even been in the building yet this year. They've been remote the whole time. So they're kind of jealous that my kids actually get to go two days a week. Like I'm very grateful for those two days. So my worry is if we remove the six feet, we, you know, these letters that we get where we find a positive COVID case, but there's no um, close contacts, that, that's gonna go out the window. There's gonna be a ton of close contacts and we risk going fully remote. Like we risk losing what we have now if we have an outbreak so big that now we, our kids can't come to school. So I just wanna be really careful. I mean, our town's still in the red. There were 2000 cases today. It's still out there. It's still like in, in the summer, the numbers were low. Those numbers I would feel better about, but I just, I just hope as much as I want my kids in school longer, you know, more days, I also don't wanna lose what we have now. Like I really appreciate those two days. So I just hope that we're careful and that we still look at the fact that we're in the red and the numbers are high and that we, Go, we go to the less than six feet really when it's safe to do so. All right, thank you, Alana. Uh, we, we appreciate the, uh, the input. Matt E, please state your name, your street and your question, please. Can you hear me? Yes. Nope, oh. where'd he go? Matt E? Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Yeah, Matt Edwards, thirty-six dollar a drive. So I, I have a couple things. I mean, one, I, I do appreciate as everyone's saying, you know, the school committee and the school board, uh, and uh, Dr. Clinchy and the principals, the work they've done to, you know, get as far as we have. I think it's been uh, it's been really great. But I, I do want to echo, you know, as Jen said, and it, it's it's it is disappointing to still not have a plan of how to move forward. Right? I mean, it's. It's, it's, it's been a long time coming and I think it is, it, it is time to have this plan in place. So I'm glad Mike, you know, you, you asked for that. Um, I, I do want to voice one concern that I, that I heard today that tonight that really, uh, really concerns me is, you know, polling the teachers of the kids that they want to bring back. And, you know, I, I really would like to understand, and I think it's the parents should be told what the criteria for getting the kids, those 35 kids back into school versus, you know, like uh, one of the other uh, members said, child 36, child 37, they didn't come back. I, I think it's <laughs> the hybrid, the hybrid learning model has not been very good for, you know, for my, my daughter. And, and I think it's, you know, school, in my opinion, doesn't work remotely, right? If, if school could be administered remotely, we wouldn't have school buildings, right? We really need to get back into school and do it as safely as we can. So I, I would ask, as as we said, you know, I'm all for bringing back, you know, high need, uh, you know, uh, children. I, I think, you know, first, I'm fine with that. But I do think we need the clarity, you know, in the community of why these 35 kids were chosen versus you know, other kids. I, I have real concerns about the, you know, that the, that choice and who's making that choice. So overall, I think it's been great. I think it's, you know, I'm glad we've been able to have the hybrid model, as the previous caller said, you know, some school districts have even, kids haven't even seen the inside of a school building this year. But, you know, I, I do think we're going to, we need to start planning on how to move on. And I would like to see a plan. I would like to utilize more of the buildings. I would like to do whatever we can to be creative to get back to school. Thank you. All right, thank you, Matt. All right. <laughs> no more questions. All right, we're good, Dorothy, thank you. All right. Uh, we're gonna go into subcommittee reports, PMBC. Mike, before we move on, can we just, oh, yep. just, just to clarify, you know, we've, this made is pretty long, I, I mean, a bunch of year. So the plan is right now is that if I understand it correctly, is that Shaker Lane and Russell street principals will start compiling and or con compiling a list and or contacting parents um, whom 
they want to invite back for four days a week um, over the next week or so, maybe. Um, and that will start on March 1st. And then at either the next school committee meeting or school committee meeting shortly thereafter, we'll start um, getting kind of a capacity analysis and, um, and continuing the conversations about upper grades. Is that am I understanding that correctly? Yep, that, that's that's the way I, I've interpreted it, Dr. Clenchy. That that sound driving with what you yeah, heard? Yes, that's right on, spot on. Right. One thing I'd like to add, and I, and I don't think we communicated it, uh, so thank you for for saying that again, and, and asking the last caller help as well. In, in, in all instances, this this isn't just a teacher decision. Many conversations throughout the year have happened with the family. So I don't want people to think that, that you know, teachers are making decisions in a void. They're, they're not. And I made that very clear with, with the principals of, of those of the two schools that, you know, we, I need to be rest assured that, that part of the decision making process, and it is, uh, is a result of, of the communication that, that our teachers and administration have had with those families as well. All right. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Brett. All right. PNBC, Tim Lynn, any? No, no update. Okay. Thank you. Budget subcommittee. Uh, sure. I can give a quick one. So there was a finance committee meeting this week that I um, attended as a, just a general listener and overheard the fact that um, it, it appears that they're, you know, we're on the short list for a couple of our uh, capital requests. So, I don't know when the actual timing um, of the official announcements become, but um, things are looking good for the, the requests that we made that were potentially some of them will be honored, which is exciting and uh, more information to follow. Okay, great. Thank you. All right. Uh, policy subcommittee. Yeah, we're ready for the second reading of the harassment policy. There has been a slight modification. Um, I think Dorothy caught we had to put Littleton in there <laughs> and to fill in the blank of um, when we're using um, kind of a template policy um, adopted from the state. Um, and so we've, we've just a slight modification just to specify which district we're talking about. But otherwise, okay. it's as read last time. All right. Uh, before we entertain a motion, because this is a second reading, is there any comments or input from the other school committee members? No, all right. I think then we are ready to accept a motion for a second reading. I'll make a motion to accept um, the second reading of the policy ACAB on harassment. Second. Uh, all right, motion made and seconded. Any further discussion? All right, hearing none, I'll take a roll call vote. Timlin? Timlin Rassius, yes. Brad? Brad Austin, yes. Matt? Matt Hunt, yes. Justin? Justin McCarthy, yes. And Mike Fontella votes yes as well. All right, thank you. What are we thinking? Uh, what's next for the policy subcommittee? You guys got any ideas? Uh, we have some great ideas. Hot. <laughs> Lots, Lots of, of ideas. Actually, we have a meeting the six, the twenty third. Our next meeting. Okay. All right. Oh, we'll keep, we have a checklist. We have a process. Yeah. Uh, we'll keep. Going. We're following in Daryl Baker's lead. There you go. We're just trying to keep it the same. Don't, it don't try to measure Dr. up to Daryl because you're going to disappoint yourself. <laughs> but just yes, try to do the best you can. Okay. Yeah, I know. I've learned that on, on PMBC too. <laughs> <laughs> exactly exactly all right all right thank you for that cpac brad anything on cpac no i don't think so okay. no. all right anything when am i missing something have we set the next meeting dash don't have my calendar in front of me there's no meeting set yet for february they're still working actively on revising the bylaws um, but there will be a parent orientation session coming up information will be sent out um that is for desi as part of our tiered focus monitoring Thank you. All right. Uh, if we don't have any other business before we adjourn, we our next meeting is March 4th, uh, which is three weeks out. Uh, and then our next meeting after that is March 18th. That is our public budget hearing. We, we're going to be all set for that budget subcommittee. Sure. <laughs> Mike. Yes, Brad. 
I mean, I miss you guys when we don't when we don't meet. I feel like we should. I feel the same maybe, way. I feel like we should meet um, before three weeks from now. we will got some data. Even if, maybe it'd be even be a short meeting, but we could. Um, I think we're going to maybe have some data to look at and um, and some updates about models. I will, uh, I, Dr. Clinch and I will talk about the meeting schedule and see what we think. Um, it's a good point. Um, I don't want to lose momentum. No, I, I don't. And I think we need, there are right. some of these conversations. We need, we're going, we don't want to rush anything. We're going to right. have to kind of get feedback and, and tweak and, um, and move forward. So I, you know, I don't know if we have to meet every week again as we were doing for, for months and months and months, but I, I think we're going to need to meet regularly as we're, if we're reconsidering and reevaluating plans and getting new sorts of data. Um, I think we should talk. Yep. I mean, one thing to keep in mind is that a, a week to get more data, like one week of data is good. Two weeks of data might be better, but let, let me, let me talk to Dr. Clenchy and, uh, and, and we'll see um, what, what we think might be worthwhile. All right. Um, all right. Anything else? All right. Then I will entertain a motion to adjourn. Make a motion to adjourn. I can. All right. Motion made and seconded. I'll take a roll call vote. Timolin? Timolin Grassi, yes. Brad? Brad Austin, yes. Matt? Matt Hunt, yes. Justin? Justin McCarthy, yes. And Mike Fontella votes yes as well. Thank you, Dorothy and Bettina and LCTV, Dave and Judy. Appreciate everybody else coming, and we'll see you guys. We'll let you know. <laughs> Thank you. Good night.